Welcome to In the Know with Erin Glow, a podcast bringing you information and inspiration from people in all walks of life. This is the Autumn Special. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Autumn Special of In the Know with Erin Glow. Happy autumn. Uh, You know, autumn is one of my favorite seasons, so I figured it'd be fun to do an autumn-themed episode. So here we are. Throughout this episode, we're going to talk about all autumn-themed things. We're going to get into some autumn fun facts like I do with every holiday-themed episode. And we have a couple of special guests who have been on the podcast before. We're going to talk to them, and we're going to do our best to put you in the fall mood. We also have a little spooky section as well for, of course, Halloween. So to start things off, I thought it would be fun to go over a special autumn bucket list. Now, this bucket list I found on a blog that's called bucketlistjourney.net, and it's run by a woman named Annette. She basically writes about her own bucket list. She gives bucket list suggestions based on topics, and it's just an overall fun, really interesting, great website to reference if you're looking to really do stuff that you've always wanted to do. So I believe she posted this back in 2020, and it's called The Ultimate Fall Bucket List of Fun Activities and Autumn Things to Do. So she has about 40 things here of what you can do during the fall season, and you may have already done some of these things in the past, especially as kids, but maybe you haven't. But the whole point is just to introduce ideas and give reminders about what we can do in the fall season. So I'm going to go over these 40 things she has listed. Of course, 40, we're going to go as quick as we can, but it'll be fun. I encourage you to embrace it. I advise you to just get out a warm cup of apple cider or a pumpkin spice latte or a maple latte or anything else that your fall-loving heart desires. Just sit back, relax, and let's have some fun with this. So here are 40 fun activities you can do in the fall. Number one, jump into a pile of leaves. I'm sure a lot of us have done this before, but she writes... Jumping into piles of crisp autumn leaves is an autumnal rite of passage, which should not be denied to the young and the young at heart. Just make sure that you've raked and piled the leaves yourself, so you are more certain the leaves will be free from small branches that can cause scratches. Very smart piece of advice there. So yeah, if you are in an area where jumping into a pile of leaves is an option, I encourage you to do it. Currently, I am not in an area where that's possible, but I am definitely willing to do this in the future when I am in an area like that. So yeah, guys, I've done it when I was little. I'm sure many of you have done it, but if you haven't, I encourage you to try it. And if you have, why not do it again? doesn't matter how old you are. Of course, it's like that adrenaline rush when you're jumping in a pile of leaves. It's, it's sort of like, it reminds me of when you're jumping in a, with those plastic balls of like Chuck E. Cheese or something. But it's a lot safer and it's uh, it's just nature and it's, it's awesome to be outside in nature. So great number one. Number two, roast chestnuts. Next to pumpkins, chestnuts are the quintessential flavor of fall. They crumble in your mouth, leaving a deliciously delicate and sweet flavor. So why not make them at home? They can easily be roasted in the oven, but for an added fall bucket list challenge, buy yourself a chestnut roaster and follow the directions in the How to Roast Chestnuts on an Open Fire article. And I will leave the link to this bucket list and everything else in the description. And she did link um, How to Roast Chestnuts on an Open Fire article here. So that's what she's referring to. So I will definitely include her bucket list and you can check that out. But yeah. I've never roasted chestnuts myself, but it sounds like something fun, and of course chestnuts are definitely a fall flavor, so yeah, I would encourage you guys to do that if you can get your hands on some chestnuts. That sounds weird if you put it in a different context, but no, we're going to move on to number three. Decorate your mantle for autumn. Okay, I've already done this. I did this beginning of September, even though it technically wasn't fall yet, but I love the autumn feel that you get when you decorate your house inside and outside. Now, I'm in an apartment, so I can't decorate outside, but I can definitely decorate inside, and when you go in my living room, it's like just confetti of fall things. It says here, vibrant colors of leaves in gold, orange, and red can be casually placed on the mantle with pumpkins and scented candles perched among them. Keep it bright and simple with plenty of texture to give a warm and cozy feel to your fireplace. If you are on the less creative side, there are some pretty fall mantle examples on Southern Living. And she included a link here, so you can check that out once you click on the bucket list link. 
Number four, take a fall foliage drive. Foretelling the coming of fall foliage is a tricky endeavor, but well worth the effort if you want to see the colorful dance of stunning reds, yellows, and orange. This color extravaganza is particularly breathtaking, so pack your binoculars, strap your hiking boots, and strap your camera around your neck, and get ready to fire up your Instagram feed with an explosion of fiery fall colors. To find out where fall is at its best, visit the Smoky Mountains Fall Foliage Prediction Map, which she linked, and plan ahead. You're bound to find a number of destinations to add to your fall bucket list. Yes, who doesn't love walking in an area that's full of changing leaves with all the beautiful colors? And so yeah, definitely good advice if you guys have a car, drive through it, or even walk through it. I mean, walking, taking in the, the air, taking in the scent, um, definitely something you should do before it gets too cold and we get into winter. Number five, get lost in a corn maze. In a recently old horror film, The Maze, which was uh, released in 2010, Five friends play tag in a corn maze only to be tracked down by a psychopathic killer. In most cases, however, the worst that can happen to you if you get lost in a corn maze is to struggle a little to get out. It won't keep you occupied for hours unless, of course, you're in a maze like the one created by Cool Patch Pumpkins in Dixon, California, which was 60 acres large and won the Guinness World Record for the largest corn maze. And that's intense. So yeah, if you have a corn maze around you, go for it. I've never done that, but it does sound like fun. I would probably suggest going with someone though if you're wanting to get lost, that way you don't feel too much anxiety, but hey, if you want to take on the challenge of going by yourself, why not do so? Number six, throw a friend's giving. Friends giving, a growing tradition spawned from the custom of Thanksgiving, has been a favorite among many. The mashup word between friends and Thanksgiving entered the dictionary in 2020 and it's your typical Thanksgiving meal, but just for your closest of friends. And me living away from my family most of the time, you know, I've definitely done this. And it is a really great thing to just have people that mean a lot to you around you during Thanksgiving. So if you can't be with your family, or you don't have family you're close to, a Friendsgiving is definitely the way to go. You know, and friends are family. In my opinion, the, the people you choose that are there for you, and, and they choose you, I mean, you can't get any more family than that, so highly suggest that one. It can make all the difference in the world on a holiday that, you know, you feel like you're supposed to be around people. Number seven, eat candy corn. Originally known as chicken feed, the production of the tricolored candy corn began in the 1880s and has since become a staple of Halloween and fall. For over 100 years, these sugar-loaded candies have been passed out to trick-or-treaters, so if you haven't tried them yet, now is the time. And one of the most popular uh, candy corn brands is Brock's, Brock's Classic Candy Corn. She left a link here, uh, and I actually do have that right now. Candy corn, it can be a little sweet. Um, I used to like it a lot more when I was younger, but I just, as an adult, I tend to not like stuff as sweet, but it's definitely a unique taste, and it's, it's a good taste, though. And it just, the second you eat that, it just brings in memories of Halloween and and fall and, and everything. So yeah, if you guys have never tried eating candy corn, I suggest it. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Some people don't like it though, but I mean, there's only one way to find out. But probably the most famous fall-related candy, I would say. So yeah, check that out. Number eight, bring a fresh baked pie to a neighbor. Make sure you squeeze a little kindness into your fall bucket list. Modern times may be hectic and sometimes alienating, but fall is always a good time to be a little more mindful and show some neighborly love. Pack all the tastes of autumn into a seasonal pie and show a little kindness to the ones next door. So yeah, if you live in a, a place where you know your neighbors, that's probably the best thing you could do. If you don't, why not try to get to know them? I mean, everyone loves a good pie. Another thing you can do under this one is bake pies and, and donate them to local food banks if they let you or just hand them out to people in need. I'm sure it will definitely be appreciated. And I mean, you have lots of options, apple, pumpkin, blueberry, cherry, whatever your little autumn heart desires. Number nine, create an autumn inspired cocktail. Now this one's fun. The flavors of autumn are many, from the taste of a spicy pumpkin latte to apple cider. Fall is also the time for cranberries and figs, which pairs to be added to punches and sangria. Plus, it's a time of hot mulled cider, boozy hot chocolate, and apple cider hot toddies added to a cup of hot water. Take all these traditional flavors and drinks to create your own autumn-inspired cocktail. Now, I've definitely had hot apple cider before. It's really good. It's also good when you're 
you know, adding a little liquor to it, and you can't disappoint. So yeah, but even not, you don't have to add liquor to it if you're not a drinker. Just make apple cider, hot chocolate. Like I said in the beginning, whatever you're drinking right now, or go on and take the challenge of trying something new. It definitely can't hurt. Number 10, tailgate at a football game. For those of you who have never heard of it before, it's when you have a casual gathering in the parking lot of a stadium before a game, which is typically football. Time-honored American traditions, such as tailgating, speak of fall and are enjoyed by all, even those who don't enjoy football. Even those of you who don't go to the football game can still recreate the tailgate experience with some snacks and a few friends to cheer for your team from the comfort of your own couch. Never done that, I've never even been to a football game, but if that's your thing, sounds like a lot of fun. And yeah, I mean, it's football season, so why not? Number 11, go apple picking at an orchard. Visits to orchards are a typical fall thing to do, and there's nothing quite as enjoyable as heading to the outdoors for some apple picking fun. Colors can range from dark green to orange, bright pink, and even a combination depending on the variety. Plus, each will have different flavor profiles. Be sure to ask the farmer at the orchard to tell you what the characteristics of the different varieties are, then you can decide what to do with them. Perhaps bake an apple pie for a neighbor? Again, that's something I've actually never done, uh, apple picking, but I know it's very popular in the fall. And I know everyone who's ever done it loved it, so definitely a good option. Number 12, carve a pumpkin, of course. The fun of scooping out pumpkin guts is as good as it gets as far as fall activities are concerned, but you need to pick the right one. These days, some producers have removed some of the guesswork by labeling pie pumpkins and carving pumpkins. However, you can find the right pumpkin for carving by tapping it and trying to hear a hollow sound, choosing one with a consistent coloring and making sure it sits flat. Once you've found the right pumpkin, push your creativity to the limits by carving out different designs from jack-o'-lantern to spooky bats. Add candles on the inside and enjoy the sweetness of the light. I'm sure most people have carved pumpkins before, especially when you were little, I know I did. And you know, it's, it is a, such a fun activity. And all you need is, is a pumpkin and usually they're very cheap. I think I, I just bought two pumpkins. One was only like a dollar or something and the other one was only like two dollars and something. So definitely worth it. And yeah, it's great that they label the pumpkins now so you can get a pumpkin that's a lot easier for carving than when you had to guess before. Number 13, DIY a pumpkin spice latte. What do you do with the pumpkin puree gutted from your carved out pumpkin? Nothing tastes of fall like a sip of pumpkin spice latte, and you don't have to go to Starbucks to get one. You can make one at home with some blended pumpkin flesh from your carved out pumpkin. Just warm any kind of milk. It could be full cream milk, non-fat milk, coconut, almond, oat, any you like. And then add the pumpkin puree, sugar, spices, and vanilla extract in a pot. Combine the pumpkin spice mixture with strong coffee and add whipped cream on the top. And there it is. You have yourself a great homemade pumpkin spice latte and I've done this before and it is really good. I recently bought a handheld uh, foamer where it foams the milk on top or the cream or whatever you're having with your coffee and it works really well and it's only like $14 on Amazon so I'd highly suggest that. Yeah they have so many different types of pumpkin spice milk out there. I have some oat milk right now that's pumpkin spice uh, or you could just use the creamer that you put in the coffee. Again, whatever your autumn-loving heart desires. But yeah, of course everyone loves the pumpkin spice lattes at Starbucks. I mean, that's what most people I know think of when they think of a pumpkin spice latte. So, I mean, of course you can go and treat yourself to that, but you don't have to be spending however much it is in your area over and over again all throughout the fall just to get that. This is a reminder that you can do it right at home. So yeah, I love this one. Number 14, do a 1,000 piece autumn-themed puzzle. Oh, I really want to do this. I haven't done a puzzle in forever, but this, I mean, there are a lot of cozy cabin puzzles that I saw online recently that I was thinking of buying, and this is just reminding me to do that. <laughs> but yeah, so you're indoors and it's raining outside. Brain teasers are the perfect fall activity for those who enjoy a challenge, and completing a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle is one of them. The whole family can sit around the table looking through the pieces. The most frustrating part is doing the puzzle only to find one piece has been misplaced. Eaten by the dog, perhaps? Who knows? Well, hopefully that won't happen to you. But yeah, go out there. I mean, all you have to do is is Google autumn-themed puzzle. I'm sure you'll find lots out there. There are Amazon, which she, uh, she links here and says they have a lot of cheap and cute autumn-inspired ones. 
And you know, working on a puzzle is also very stress relieving. So even if you don't have like a family to do it with or just friends over, you can even do that on your own and just because it requires a lot of focus, which is a lot like meditation. So yeah, it can be very therapeutic. Great choice. Number 15, visit the local pumpkin patch. What better place to pick a pumpkin than at the pumpkin patch? It's one of the most exciting fall things to do for families because most producers also include other activities, such as hay rides, to enhance the experience. The best time to arrive is 15 minutes before the gates open, so as to not have to wait in a long line or arrive too late to pick the best pumpkins. I mean, one of the most popular activities again, like apple picking for fall, go to the pumpkin patch, you won't be disappointed. Number 16. Participate in a Halloween costume contest. Now, trick-or-treating is one of the best places to show off your costumes, but take it up a notch and attend a Halloween event where you can enter your ensemble into a contest. Not all is not lost, even if you have nowhere to go. If there's no costume contest near you, perhaps you can submit your costume to a virtual contest. And yes, those are very popular right now with social media and just websites in general. So yeah, look those up. Um, Especially when you're an adult, I mean, that's really an excuse to go out and dress up when you can go to something like that, because you're likely not trick-or-treating as an adult, so yeah, it's always fun, and you take good pictures, and get in the Halloween mood. All right, number 17, attend a fall festival. There's something magical about autumn, with its colorful leaves, cider smells, and Halloween activities. All around the world, the significance of fall is celebrated, from China's Mid-Autumn Moon Festival to India's Diwali Festival of Lights. These are worth putting on your fall bucket list. Fall festivals are a plenty, and chances are there's a fall festival happening somewhere near you. Yeah, I'm sure if you just Google fall, local fall festival, you'll find something, and it's worth checking out. Those are always fun, and you can't do them unless it's fall, so another great thing to add to the list. Number 18. Host a board game night. Stay in for the evening, get cozy in your jammies, and have a game night marathon. There are different games for all ages, but Bingo and Scrabble are favorites for friends and everyone in the family. You can make it even more fun by adding prizes for the winner, like store gift cards, candies, or extra TV time for the kids. I mean, you can play board games at any time of the year, but when it's chilly outside and you're having your pumpkin spice latte and you're doing your puzzle and you want to take a break, What better way to bond than over a game and they're fun and adrenaline inducing and the best part is all you need is a board game. You don't need to go out, you don't need to dress up. It's all good right where you are. Number 19, get cozy by a wood burning fire. Autumn is the right time for warmth and relaxation. Just imagine yourself in front of a log fire watching the dancing flames while sipping on a glass of wine or warm apple cider, rain outside and your faithful dog sitting beside you. To enhance the experience, add some scents to the fireplace. For instance, dried apple for a fruity scent, lemon peel for a sweet fragrance, cinnamon sticks or pine cones to bring the spirit of a pine forest to your home. If you have a fireplace, get to it. Or if you have a safe place to do it outside, it's also a good option. I mean, there's nothing more to say about that. It's definitely cozy, definitely making it feel like autumn. Go for it. Number 20, plant fall flowers. Fall flowers like pansies and mums will ensure that your garden looks colorful and at its eye-catching best. Consult with your supplier to be certain that you make the best choices for where you live and to determine where perennials will flower through the fall months. Before making your decision, visit a growing zone map, which is a helpful guide to help you choose the most suitable varieties for your location. And the growing zone map she has a link to as well. So yeah, if you're a gardener, planting fall flowers, definitely a fun thing to do. Number 21, perfect a soup recipe. It's time to get cozy with a steaming hot bowl of soup. Use pumpkin flesh, leftovers, or corn from the autumn harvest and work on perfecting your best soup recipe. Some tricks to making great soup include roasting the veggies, browning the meat in a saute pan before adding it to the soup, using homemade stock and adding fresh herbs and dairy when serving it. We also believe that the real secret to creating the perfect soup is making it with love and care. Of course. Who doesn't love a good soup on a cozy autumn night? Nothing really needs to be added to that one. Number 22. Bake pumpkin bread. Super moist pumpkin bread doesn't have to be complicated. Sometimes the simplest things are the best. And then she has three recipes listed here for some pumpkin bread that you can try. One is called Down East Main Pumpkin Bread. Second one is pumpkin bread with maple glaze. That sounds interesting and yummy. And the third is Taste of Home Pumpkin Bread. So again, when you click on this link in the description, you can go to number 22 and you'll see those links there. 
Number 23, complete an autumn craft. Looking for fun fall activities to keep the kids busy? Just pick up pine cones, autumn leaves, and anything else in nature around you and let your children use their imagination to create anything they desire from gold-plated leaf bookmarks to arty leaf prints. Go to Pinterest and YouTube for plenty of ideas. Now this doesn't always have to be just kids. This could be adults because I'd love to do autumn crafts and I know there are a lot of influencers on Instagram that do this regularly and I was actually following one recently who has been making autumn crafts and they're really cool. So yeah, just look those up and I'm sure you'll find something that, that would be easy and fun to make. Or maybe you want a challenge and you want to spend more time on it. Either way, autumn crafts are, are awesome and then you, if you make your own, you'd have a unique decoration to put out in autumn and no one else would have it just like you. So Number 24, go on a hay ride. Hay rides are connected with celebrations of the autumn harvest. Originally, farm children would ride hay wagons to the barn for unloading the harvest. During those busy times, the hay rides were among the few times when they could stop to rest. City tourists to the regions found it enjoyable, and by the late 19th century, hay rides became tourist attractions. So yeah, if that's in your area, definitely go and do that. It sounds like a lot of fun. Number 25, visit a farmer's market. Take a break from your hectic lifestyle and practice a bit of mindfulness to appreciate the simple things in life. And there's nothing more ideal than choosing homegrown produce offered by farmers themselves at farmer's market. Going from stall to stall, you become more appreciative of the produce that comes from the good earth. So there's a website called the National Farmer's Market Directory, and that's what you can go on, and she links it here uh, to find a farmer's market near you. And yeah, you're gonna get the freshest produce, and it's also just a fun experience to visit and just look at everything and all of that. Number 26, roast pumpkin seeds. Who hasn't done this? Have you fleshed out your pumpkin? Don't throw away the seeds. Just toss a cup of whole pumpkin seeds with some olive oil and salt, then place them on a baking sheet. Bake at 300 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes, and you have the perfect snack for the season. Now you can also buy roasted pumpkin seeds in the store, but it's a lot of fun when you make them yourself, especially after you're carving your pumpkin, so definitely fun to do. Don't forget to do that once you carve your pumpkin this year. Number 27, get spooked at a haunted house. If staying at a real-life haunted house at one of the Airbnb accommodation options is not your cup of tea, you may enjoy finding a haunted location near you. Wikipedia has a long list of the top haunted locations from around the world, many of which you should add to your fall bucket list. So yeah, you could go to like a haunted location that's a real location or, you know, a haunted house that's set up in your area just for the holiday where they have, you know, the actors who dress up in scary costumes and things like that. If that's your cup of tea, go for that. I, for one, don't like being spooked as much as I did when I was little as an adult. But yeah, that could be something fun for people who are looking to be scared, especially around Halloween. Number 28, sip warm apple cider. Very straightforward. One of the most popular things to do. You might be doing it right now, as I suggested. Uh, enjoy a steamy hot cup of apple cider on its own, or just use it as a base for some autumn-worthy sangrias. Apple cider is the perfect drink for entertaining your fall harvest party or Halloween soiree. You can buy it or make it from scratch by placing apples in a pot and covering with water before stirring in cinnamon, allspice, and sugar. So if you have any leftover apples, definitely do that. I actually have some leftover apples right now that I need to use before they go bad, so that is definitely something I think I will try. But yeah, you can also buy instant apple cider. It may not be as good, but there are lots of ways to make or buy apple cider. And apple cider is best at fall time. So go out there and get some apple cider if you don't have some already. Let me know which one you think is the best, and I'll try it. That's a challenge for you guys. Okay, number 29, take your Christmas card photo. It's never too early to take that family Christmas photo. You can never trust the kids being cooperative or the post to be on time, so get it done early. After you've got the perfect shot, choose from the many cute photo card templates on Shutterfly or Minted, which she has linked here. Yeah, so getting ready for Christmas ahead of time. I mean, it is better to be early than to be rushing last minute. So if you have a family or if you want to do it with your pet or even do it alone, <laughs> want to think about doing that if you haven't yet if that's the kind of christmas card you want to send out number 30 make a scarecrow whether you are a farmer wishing to protect the harvest or just looking to create decorations for your thanksgiving dinner then making a scarecrow is fun and easy all you need are some old clothes a mannequin or something to prop it up a bit of straw and imagination if it's birds you want to scare then you should know that the ability of the lifelike scarecrow to get rid of them is usually temporary 
to be effective, they need to be moved around every so often. I didn't know that, so that's interesting. So yeah, I don't know how many people have a mannequin sitting around, but um, yeah, I'm sure like a stick and then you make like just a round maybe cushion as the face or, or something. And she has some cute little photos here of some different ones. And yeah, I mean, you think of every fall movie, especially horror movies, there's so many scarecrows in those. So it's definitely a fall thing. Number 31, have a scary movie marathon. And this is something I always do around this time of year. It's also something I've been doing because I decided to challenge myself hardcore this year and try and watch every single horror movie franchise from the 1930s to now <laughs> um, in order. So I'm still only in the 1930s, but it's been interesting and fun to do that. Some movies are horrible. They're not even really horror movies, but they're labeled that. So I watch them. And then others are just gems that you would never think to watch because they're so old. So it's definitely something I'd recommend if you have the time or just take a little time out of your week every week and do it until you get through them all. But yes, it says here, nothing says Halloween more than indoor fall activities and a scary movie marathon may just be the thing to take your mind off real life scary problems knocking at your door. If you want to keep it G-rated, watch The Addams Family, Casper, Hotel Transylvania, etc. But if you need something scarier than flicks like The Shining, It or Carrie would surely spook you out definitely classic movies there and of course probably the most popular halloween related film halloween <laughs> and i'm gonna have more scary movie and fall related movie suggestions coming up in the episode here in a little bit so stay tuned for that but yeah have a scary movie marathon number 32 go hiking at national park find a sunny fall day for a road trip to a national park enjoy the golden colors of the countryside and mountain air Pack a picnic hamper and don't forget your camera because you're bound to see some Instagram-worthy natural wonders. I know hiking's not for everyone, but if it's for you or you just want to take a walk at your pace, I mean, again, nothing beats nature and seeing your surroundings and taking in that fresh air and breathing that in and, and just calming down. It's a natural source of therapy, for me at least, and I'm sure many others. And fall is one of the best times of year to do that because it's not too cold and it's not too warm. This would be an appropriate time to say go take a hike and actually literally mean it. <laughs> All right, number 33, tour your town's Halloween decorations. So this is fun. Do your neighbors decorate their houses? Are there any particular streets which are hot spots when it comes to the Halloween spirit? Most people start decorating their homes for Halloween in the first fortnight of October, though early birds kick off in late September. It's always lots of fun to tour the neighborhoods and pick out the best decorated homes. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to Christmas, but it's not as popular. But yeah, there are a lot of Halloween decorations out there on homes if you pay attention. And I think it's becoming more popular nowadays than it used to because I've been seeing a lot of Instagram pages where they're dedicated to doing that and showing people how to do that. And I think people are taking on more of the challenge and the ideas. So no matter where you live, I'm sure you'd be able to find some out there. And yeah, don't even like hesitate to take photos if, as long as there's not like a no photo taking signs or something like that. But most people want you to admire their decorations, so that's why they put them out there. Number 34, hang a handmade wreath on your door. For a welcoming entrance to your home, create an autumn wreath out of the gifts from nature you've collected on your hike. There are plenty of YouTube videos to help you in your colorful creation, and you can even adapt it later on by adding a few berries and glitter for Christmas. Two for one, making a fall wreath into a Christmas wreath by just adding a few things. And wreaths are one of those classic decorations that, you know, if it's done right or looks right, it can make any door or just wall or anything look festive and, and just a lot better and not so plain. Number 35, make a traditional Thanksgiving meal. Now remember, Thanksgiving is in the fall, even though sometimes we only tend to think of Halloween as a fall-related holiday. Thanksgiving is a fall holiday as well, so Thanksgiving is a time to be grateful, and there's no better thing to give thanks for than being able to be surrounded by family, friends, and good food. Though many households have adapted to their own holiday meals traditionally, a Thanksgiving dinner consists of turkey with gravy, stuffing, mashed potatoes, green beans, rolls, cranberry sauce, and pumpkin pie. Duplicate this tradition. And you know, coming on later in the episode as well, my guests and I are going to talk about some of our favorite fall-related meals or treats that we've tried and we love and we want to give to you. So we'll have those recipes in the description as well. We'll get more into that later. But yeah, make a traditional Thanksgiving meal. I mean, that's classic 
I mean, a lot of people do that on Thanksgiving. Some people will buy things out, but I mean, I encourage you to try to make a meal, even if it's for yourself. I mean, I've done that once. I made a meal just for me and I just didn't make a ton of it, but it was definitely yummy and it taught me how to cook things in the right way and, and all of that. So don't hesitate to try it out if you can and if you want to for either your Thanksgiving meal or of course your Friendsgiving meal, if that's what you're celebrating. Number 36, shop on Black Friday. I'm not a fan of this one, but I know some people love shopping, and I mean the best deals of course are on Black Friday, day after Thanksgiving. So Black Friday is the shopping day after Thanksgiving, and it's a day that's a win for shoppers and retailers alike. Since the 1980s, the day has been a celebration of sales with great discounts for shoppers. With these crazy good sales, the early bird definitely gets the worm. You may even have to camp out in front of the store's doors. Luckily, with the popularity of online shopping, you can also snag some deals without even leaving the house. And that has definitely become more popular in the last few years with the online shopping. I did do some online shopping last year and got some really great deals. So if you're not a person who likes to go out and be around a lot of people, be around that craze of what is Black Friday, then I would suggest going on Amazon. I know they also have Cyber Monday which is usually the sales all online, and I think that might be the Monday after Black Friday. Let's check that, but yeah, I mean, there's ways around it. You don't have to go in person, but I know some people who actually like to go in person. They look forward to it. They look forward to standing in line. It's almost like a concert experience where you're waiting to get something fun, and, and it's like a social experience if you have people to go with. But remember, it might be chilly depending on where you're at because that's starting to get into the coldness of winter, which would only be a few weeks later, so. So yeah, shop online, shop in person, whatever floats your fall boat, <laughs> go ahead and do it and find either some gifts for your loved ones or for you. Number 37, host a bonfire. Did you know that Halloween was originally an ancient pagan Irish festival, meaning end of summer? The people involved would light bonfires to keep evil spirits away because they believed that on Halloween, these spirits would visit the mortal world. It was called a bone fire because animal bones were burnt as a way of keeping the ghoulies at bay. These days, you can keep the evil spirits at bay, but your friends nearby with a little bit of music, wine, and song. Bonfires, uh, it's just, it reminds me of making s'mores and just getting that cozy campfire spirit, which is also relative to Halloween and, and the fall feeling. So yeah, great one to be on this list. Number 38, burn fall candles. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I do this all the time. Uh, I have a fall candle burning right now, and there's nothing to inspire feelings of contentedness than candles, releasing scents of apples, pumpkin, cinnamon, amber, and spice around the house. They look adorable too in their little mason jars or twine wrapped tin containers. So, yeah, candles, of course, they have all kinds of scents that can be lit year round, but there's just something about burning a fall candle, a scented candle even if it's unscented, just having that whole vibe going with the coziness and wrapping yourself up in a blanket, watching a fall movie or listening to a fall song, definitely one of my favorites. Number 39, knit a scarf. Fall has always been a special time for knitters ready to work on their craft in preparation of the winter days ahead. For experienced knitters, scarves make easy projects and can be worn in a variety of ways to cover up any silly mistakes. Plus, those who master the art won't ever need to buy Christmas presents again. You can find several different how-to videos on YouTube, but this step-by-step -step video on how to knit a scarf for beginners is one of the best, and she links that here. Yeah, you know, I've always wanted to try this. My friend gave me a knitting kit, and I never got around to it, and it's just something that I wanted to try, but I really need to, to carve out time for that, not just carving out pumpkins. <laughs> but yeah, you think of all the things you can make when you knit. You can make quilts. You, you can make blankets, you can make scarves, you can make little, I know, craft things, um, all these things. And they do make great gifts. And what's great about knitting is, again, it's also an activity that is a lot like meditation because you have to focus so much. You know, there's certain types of activities that force you to focus and in turn that makes you calm down and just take deep breaths and not worry and if you have an overloaded mind you kind of have to calm that mind to know what you're doing to pay attention to what you're doing and then at the end of it you get something awesome 
knitting a scarf, doing a puzzle, all those things. I also like coloring a lot, so maybe go out there and find a fall-inspired coloring book. They have adult coloring books as well, and I have a few of those. And again, that forces you to kind of concentrate and calm your mind, so awesome activity. Number 40, watch the Macy's Day Parade. Every year, the Macy's Day Parade keeps tradition with its festive balloons, floats, and street performers. Whether you are able to catch it live or watch it on television, you are sure to be wowed by the world's largest parade. And of course, that parade takes place in New York City, so if you're not in New York City, watch it on TV. I've done it almost every year of my life. It really gets me in the mood for Thanksgiving and and Christmas coming. So that's like an end of the fall type of uh, activity. Even though we're technically in fall till the end of December, it doesn't always feel that way because once Thanksgiving is over, it's like, oh, Christmas. And Christmas is in winter. So yeah, yeah, there's not one person I know that didn't grow up with the Macy's Day Parade my age. Um, I'm not sure when it started, but of course it's been going on for many years and it's just a great, great way to celebrate this time of year. And again, if you're in the city, New York City, and you like big crowds, you could probably catch it live. But again, I don't know. With the whole pandemic thing going on, maybe it won't be as crowded. But again, for me, I'm, I'd have to really be focused in the mood to do that because being around a lot of people is definitely not, tends to be a little energy draining for me. So, but if that's something you like, I would suggest looking up tips on what to do on that day. I think you need to get there really early in the morning or even the night before possibly. Just make sure you're in a safe area where you're watching the parade and that you have a lot of cozy blankets and jackets because it's usually cold on that day. And I know it's rained even on some days, so just be prepared. Uh, Otherwise, watch it from your couch. And of course, Santa always makes an appearance at the end, getting you ready for Christmas. That's always one of the best parts, so yeah. So that was number 40. So we had 40 things on this bucket list, but there's also a bonus, number 41, and this is probably one of the most important ones. And that is make a gratitude journal. Gratitude should be a year-round thing, but it's especially important in the season of giving thanks. Start each morning by listing five things you are grateful for. In the beginning, it will probably be a struggle to come up with a mere five. Being wrapped up in a world full of fear can disguise the good in your life. Think hard. Did you just drink a deliciously warm cup of coffee? Or did you connect with a friend by text? Or enjoy a heartwarming movie on television? There is always something to be grateful for always. And I totally, totally agree. I've made some gratitude journals, not just for fall, but in general. And, you know, I kept them going for a while, but then sometimes life just seems to distract you and and you forget or or you say, oh, I'll do it later. And then later turns into a day, a few days, weeks, months, years. And before you know it, you stop doing it. So don't beat yourself up if that happens and you're not used to doing it. It's just, you got to make it another daily thing you do. And And it will really help because it'll make you stop and think of what good things you have in your life, especially when you're going through some tough times. So I encourage you guys and challenge you guys to start a gratitude journal or go back to the gratitude journal that you stopped doing, (laughs) if you're like me. What better way to start it, though, and around Thanksgiving when you're supposed to be giving thanks. So to top off this bucket list, the blogger Annette says, As you can see, fall activities are plentiful. They come in beautiful colors, pumpkins galore, and a bit of Halloween horror. Our fall bucket list of things to do is filled to the brim with all sorts of ideas to get you started. We suggest making your list that has you enjoying the splendor of an amazing season. Just let yourself fall in love with fall. Perfect ending to a wonderful bucket list. So guys, go out there and try to do as many as you can of those. If they appeal to you or make your own, let me know what you're doing. I'd love to hear about it. Send me a message. Tag me on social media. Let me know what you're doing for your own fall bucket list. And you might even inspire me to do some as well. So yeah, thank you, Annette, for making that on bucketlistjourney.net. Check her out on there. She has a lot of other kinds of bucket lists and just anything achieving goals, just giving you that little boost of inspiration. And she's wearing a shirt that says bucket list boss. So so, uh, she definitely is a good person to turn to when it comes to bucket lists. So thank you to her and her website. I found it really uh, beneficial and fun to read this and thought I'd share it with you guys. I hope you enjoyed it too. And it really got me in the fall mood. So get to it. All right, we're going to move on to the next part of the episode. But before I do that, I want to introduce two very special people. You heard them back last year on the Halloween-themed episode. 
and they're complete horror buffs and love everything autumn so i figured i'd invite them on for this episode again and they could have some autumn fun with me so please welcome back tony and derek to the show hi guys hey thanks for having us back yes thank you for having us back yeah i'm excited to have you here all right are you guys ready for some autumn fun facts yeah let's hear them yeah let's hear them all right so to begin this part of the episode i did a little research on some fun interesting facts about the fall season so the source of these facts is red book magazine and i'm gonna get right into it number one fall was once called harvest now the season once had a third name as well in 12th and 13th century middle english fall was called higher fest hope i'm saying that right (laughs) which was the act of taking in crops. Eventually it was known as harvest because the full moon closest to the autumn equinox is called the harvest moon. Number two, the term fall came from a phrase. After fall was known as harvest, it eventually came to be called autumn. So how did fall become the dominant term? In the early 1600s, people started moving into cities and use of the term harvest lessened. They started saying fall of the leaf to refer to the third season of the year because the leaves would fall from the trees. Over time, fall of the leaf was shortened to fall and it stuck. Yeah, I always just kind of assumed that it was called fall because the leaves fall off the tree, but I never knew the origin of it. Yeah, it makes sense. Number three, children born in the fall may be more likely to live longer. Now this is interesting. Research has shown that people born in the fall are more likely to live to 100 years old. And no, it's not just a coincidence. Studies show that the month you're born in can influence the environment you develop in, both inside the womb and out. That environment can do everything from affecting your behavior to your overall health. That's interesting. That's good news for me. Oh, yeah, that's right. You were born in the fall. Yeah, no, I'm a summer baby. Nah, spring. So I'm screwed. (laughs) Definitely Scorpio. Scorpio season's coming. Yeah, and it does make sense because, like, fall... The weather isn't too bad, you know, it's not too cold or too hot, and and I don't know, I guess that can affect the baby in the womb through the mother as well, because if the mother gets sick, or it makes sense, I think. I guess, but I've also heard at times cold can be good for the body and mind and everything, so, but. Yeah, maybe that's in the winter facts. <laughs> <laughs> so that means Tony will probably outlive us all. Yeah. I can't wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four. Fall colors depend on how much sugar is in the leaves. Fall leaf colors are caused by certain pigments in the leaves, and different kinds of trees produce different pigments. When you notice leaves that are purple and red, that's caused by the anthocyanins pigment. And yes, I did have to look up how to say that, which is only produced in the fall when sugars are trapped in the leaves. Lots of dry weather and sunlight will lead to more sugars in the leaves, meaning the leaves will be brighter red. Freezing, meanwhile, stops the process of making red pigments. I bet the painters out there love that fact. Number five. Bobbing for apples was once a British courting ritual. (laughs) Bobbing for apples has been a popular, if kind of disgusting, party game for Halloween celebrations for a long time, but it wasn't always about the spooky holiday. It actually started out as a British courting ritual. Males were assigned an apple, and females would bob for them, trying to get the right, <laughs> the right apple from the man she wanted. If she did, it meant they were destined to be together. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? That's like weirder than those mating bird rituals. Like, what does that even <laughs> accomplish? I, I don't get it. It's a fun thing to do, I guess, but... I mean, it's... I mean... Not as unusual as what we do today in these days. I mean, Tinder. (laughs) (laughs) Guess it's better than an arranged marriage. Oh, God. I mean, it's cheaper. It's an apple. It's an apple? What? It's it's cheaper because it's an apple. Don't you have to pay, like, memberships to, like, push and mingle and stuff like that? I'd rather go to the grocery store and spend a dollar (laughs) than $9.99 a month. (laughs) (laughs) Point taken. Yeah. Cool. All right, number six, heart attack rates drop in the fall. The spring equinox that causes us to lose an hour is the worst, but gaining an hour during the autumn equinox is actually good for us. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, 
The rate of heart attacks for Americans is known to fall on the Monday following the end of daylight savings time. Hmm. Number seven. Ancient people wore Halloween costumes to scare off ghosts. Halloween is incredibly popular during the fall, and it's a holiday that has been around for a very long time. But centuries ago, it was a little different, and more dark. It celebrated human death, and the Celts believed that on the night before Halloween, the boundary between the living and the dead came down. They started wearing scary costumes in order to scare away the ghosts that they believed walked the earth on Halloween. Yeah, it, um, Halloween on the 31st of October, that's when the moon is at its brightest and the veil is thinnest. So that is true. Yeah, wasn't it called sense. like All Hallows Eve originally? I mean, you know more about that than I would, Tony. It was, it was uh, depending on which branch that you look at it, Celtic, Paganism, but it was all, it, it sooner or later came All Hallows Eve. Yeah. Cool. All right. And finally, number eight. The Irish used to carve turnips and potatoes. Much like Halloween costumes, jack-o'-lanterns started out as a way for people to scare off evil spirits around Halloween. Back in the day, the Irish carved the faces into turnips, beets, or potatoes instead of pumpkins. That's so stereotypical. <laughs> uh-huh. All right, we're going to move on to some media suggestions for the autumn. Now, I haven't seen all of these or heard them all, but I did a little research, and apparently these are some of the top, not all of them, because there's way too many to list, but these are some of the top autumn types of media. So we're going to start off with movies. Now, these movies either took place in the autumn or have an autumn vibe, or maybe not the whole movie took place in autumn, but just part of it, but overall, it's considered a very autumny movie. Autumny, if that's a word. Okay, here we go. So we have... Dead Poet Society, When Harry Met Sally, If Beale Street Could Talk, Hocus Pocus, October Sky, Remember the Titans, Practical Magic, Far From Heaven, Autumn in New York, Stepmom, You've Got Mail, Coco, The Cider House Rules, The Lake House, Election, Clueless, Legally Blonde, Silver Linings Playbook, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Pieces of April, The Ice Storm, Goodwill Hunting, All That Heaven Allows, Sweet November, Autumn Sonata, Little Women, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Halloween, Sleepy Hollow, It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Matilda, St. Elmo's Fire, Friday Night Lights, School Ties, The Craft, and Halloween Town. Lots of good movies there. Oh yeah, I think Remember the Titans is the best movie of all time, personally. And then Halloween Town was a favorite when I was younger. Matilda too. Matilda's a good movie. It's really good acting for such a young child at the time. Yeah, and just of course Halloween classic. Oh yeah, it's iconic. We talked about that enough in uh, the last podcast. The la- last year's podcast. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say, like, during this time, like, fall and winter, it's definitely Harry Potter-thon. Like, all of the movies. Yeah, yeah I'm not the biggest fan of, like, fantasy-type movies, but I always did kind of like Harry Potter. There's something about, like, the whole witch-wizard-type thing. It just makes it feel kind of more Halloween-y, if that's a word. <laughs> spooky. I think that's <laughs> yeah. what the right now. Spooky. It's spooky season. All right, so, moving on to TV shows. Now, a lot of these TV shows also take place in the fall, but of course, you know, TV shows most likely go through all the seasons, unless it's just one season. So we have Gilmore Girls, October Road, The Haunting of Hill House, This Is Us, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Bates Motel, Stranger Things, My So-Called Life, Charmed, American Horror Story, and The Twilight Zone. Yeah, Hill House is a really good season, um, but I think Bates Motel, that's one of my, or Bates Motel, yeah, that's one of my favorite shows ever. I think just everything about it is perfect. The acting, the story, sticking to Psycho and having elements in it, but like also making it its own thing in a way. I don't know. Just a very good show. Yeah, and you guys are actually the ones who told me about The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix, and it is really, really good. I would highly suggest that. They they did it's one of those shows where it's just one season. And they did a second season with a different different story, but had some of the same actors in it. 
but I don't think it was as it was okay, but it wasn't as good as the first one. So I would highly suggest that one. I have never finished it yet. I still want to at some point, but I think Hill House (laughs) 2 has like one of the best jump scares in everything ever of all time. (laughs) It's terrifying. The car scene. Oh my gosh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They yeah, it seemed like that they were trying to take the same formula that American Horror Story has. Like every season's going to be a new story, but we're gonna incorporate the same cast as much as we can. Yeah. So it's kinda like a it's kinda like an American horror story light to me. Like it's kinda like a diet American horror story. In yeah, my mind. I've liked American Horror Story less, I think, like each time I've watched it. I still like it, it's still a good show, but I don't know. It's just I feel like he focuses way too much on unnecessary things and shock factor rather than it's got good stories. though. that's the thing. I still like it. But yeah, it's an acquired taste. (laughs) Yeah, it it definitely is. American Horror Story. I mean, the first six seasons were really great. And then I can get it, though. Yeah. All right. So to top off the autumn media, we have songs. Now, these songs are all about the fall season. Harvest Moon by Neil Young, Autumn Leaves by Ed Sheeran, November by Chase Coy, Wake Me Up When September Ends by Green Day, Autumn in New York by Ella Fitzgerald, November Rain by Guns N' Roses, Autumn Leaves by Eva Cassidy, Autumn Almanac by The Kinks, We're Gonna Be Friends by The White Stripes, Harvest Time by Luke Bryan, The Boys of Fall by Kenny Chesney, November by Tom Waits. All Too Well by Taylor Swift, Gone Till November by Wyclef Jean, The Chill of an Early Fall by George Strait, Autumn Song by Van Morrison, September by Earth, Wind, and Fire, Forever Autumn by Justin Hayward, Autumn's Not That Cold by Laurie Morgan, When Fall Comes to New England by Cheryl Wheeler, Autumn Town Leaves by Iron and Wine, We Fell in Love in October by Girl in Red, and Harvest Fair by Somersault. And those obviously are all different genres of music. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to move on to our next segment, and it's all about our favorite autumn movies. Now, I chose one of my favorite autumn movies for Tony to watch, and Tony chose one of his favorite autumn movies for me to watch. And we both watched them, and we're going to talk about it. So if When we mention these movies, if you don't want to know what happens in them, don't listen to the next segment because we're going to talk about the plot and all of that. But yeah, we we decided to kind of swap each other's favorite autumn movies and give our opinions on them. And then Derek is going to do something fun where Derek actually watched both of them and he's going to give us his opinion and he's going to pick a winner on which one he thinks is the best out of both of ours. So, and we have no idea because we didn't talk to him about it. So, (laughs) we don't know what he's going to say. So, now, I'll start off. Tony chose Practical Magic. Very classic movie from the 90s. All about witches and and gives a Halloween and fall vibe. Now, the movie came out in 1998. It's considered a fantasy romantic drama. And it's actually based on the 1995 novel of the same name by Alice Hoffman. The movie stars Sandra Bullock. Nicole Kidman, Stockard Channing, Diane West, and Aidan Quinn. Those are the most popular actors in the film. The plot of the movie is basically you have two sisters named Sally and Jillian Owens. They're descended from a long line of witches. They're raised by their aunts after their parents' death from a family curse, and the sisters were taught the uses of practical magic as they grew up. As adults, Sally and Jillian must use their magic to destroy an evil spirit before it kills them. So, one of the things I I liked about this movie was, well, first let's get into the difference of the two sisters. They have very different personalities. I really liked that a lot. I think people watching the movie could relate to one of them. And I think it, it would bring you in more, tells the story more. So you have Jillian, who's more of the laid-back, fun-loving wild type of girl she's played by nicole kidman and then you have sally who's played by sandra bullock she's basically the more mature one if you want to call her that she 
gets married, has a couple kids, and she's living the life of just, she calls it a blissfully normal life. That's what she calls it. And she just is enjoying life as, you know, a wife and a mother and has, you know, has a career, a small business. And then you have Jillian who she, I think she moves to Los Angeles. She starts dating all these men and then she finds herself in an abusive relationship. And she asks her sister to come help her. Uh, And that leads into the main plot of the movie where Jillian gets possessed by her boyfriend and it just leads into the spiral of like a curse and and bad spells and all of that. Now, I liked the different personalities. I also liked the symbols of you have, they had like a black beetle and the black beetle, it was a beetle that if one of the sisters saw the beetle crawling somewhere, it meant that the person she was romantically involved with was going to die. And that's what happened to Sally's husband. And she eventually, by the end of the movie, found uh, someone else and lived happily ever after, if you want to call it that. But I liked how they used the beetle because I found that it was like a representation of not just literal representation of death, but the fear of death and fear in general, anxiety about things in life. It was like, if you believe it, it will happen. If you don't believe it, it won't happen. Of course, there were curses involved in the movie, but I also think it represented just a deep fear that a lot of people will have, you know, even if they're not witches, you know, and I, I think if you look at it that way, it can appeal to a whole ton of people and, and just see it as, you know, what do you really want to believe? Do you really have the power to believe in good things? Do you really have the power to break your own curse inside your head? That thing, maybe I'm thinking too much into it, but I think that's a really cool way to look at it. So I liked that. Uh, again, I think the sisters balanced each other out well. They were there for each other in the ways that they both needed. I liked the cheekiness of the, the ants. They were funny. Uh, but they were also caring. So you had like these two ant figures or aunt, wherever you're from, you might say it differently. But they were just these caring women. But they also were like the typical stereotype, like witches who are giddy and, oh, we're going to cast the spells and we're going to do all this. And those are always fun to watch. It reminds me of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, that show growing up. I believe she had her aunts. She lived with her aunts and they were similar. That's what this movie reminded me of as well. And yeah, I just think overall it was a fun movie to watch because it gave me a vibe too because they're in they're supposed to be in Massachusetts. So it gave me a vibe of like the Salem witch trials and all that history. And I'm actually going to talk about that later. But yeah, overall, I think it, it was it was a good movie to, to kind of dig into history a little bit, but it also had a cheekiness about Halloween. And then it had the bond between the two sisters that proved to be stronger than any curse in the end. And I just think overall, it really made you think for a kind of a comedy fantasy movie. And it was just fun to watch. So I actually liked it. I think it was a pretty good movie. Uh, Tony, what did you like about this movie? Why'd you suggest it? No, I just like the movie because not only does it take place in Massachusetts, and it was a sense of awe because, you know, the location is beautiful there. The soundtrack is amazing. The story is really good especially when it's talking about the the curse of their family and um she actually made this spell in the beginning because she never wanted to fall in love so she made a spell of somebody that didn't exist like one a person with one blue eye one green eye and i thought at such a young age that children are like so scared of falling in love she didn't want to fall in love but her sister wanted to fall in love she couldn't wait for it so it had like the different dynamics of both sisters and yeah, they matched each other perfectly. And I think the best part of the whole entire movie was uh, Midnight Margaritas. The aunts were amazing. Yes. Yeah. And you mentioned the soundtrack earlier. I was going to mention that too. You have some Faith Hill, Elvis, really good catchy songs in there. Definitely Stevie Nicks. You cannot go wrong in any magical movie and not have stevie nicks like that would be even american horror story coven they had stevie nicks it's a very she's a very she's a white witch she's amazing (laughs) doesn't she always wear black too she she 
changes it a lot, but she mostly wears black. But there's other times that she's worn white, like in her Sorcerer music video with uh, Shao Crow. Like she, she, you know, dabbles with this and that. But I guess as her age came, she just started wearing more black. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have a, a favorite character in this movie? It was really hard because I liked them all. But the favorite character probably would be Stalker Channings. Mm, yep. One of the ants, right? One of the ants, because both of the ants were wonderful, but Stalker Channing probably. And she's such an icon as well in playing that role. It was really it was really heartwarming, but it was also funny as well. Like, they weren't strict ants. They were fun ants, but they told you like it is. They never sugarcoated anything. Yes, yes. They had, the, like I said, the caring and the fun dynamic. Can't go wrong there. If you notice, the ants shared a lot of the nature of the sisters. There was the more stricter one that was down to earth, and then there was the lighthearted one. And they kind of bounced back and forth. Yes, for sure. All right, so great suggestion, Tony. I'm glad I watched that. I actually think I tried watching that a couple years ago, but I never got all the way through it um, because it became familiar to me. There was a point where I was trying to watch as many auto movies as I could a few years ago, and... That was on the list, so I'm glad I got through it. And yeah, I would suggest it to other people who want a an autumn slash Halloweeny vibe movie, but not totally like a horror movie. I think this would be good, and it's a love story as well, like a chick flick, whatever you want to call it. So it has all those vibes into one, which is probably one of the best things about it. Okay, so Tony, you can go ahead with the movie I chose for you to watch. Okay, so the movie that Aaron picked was Stepmom, which coincidentally was also made in 1998 as well. Um, The headliners to that movie was Susan Sarandon, amazing actress, and Juliet Roberts. Also in this movie is Ed Harris and Jenna Malone, who you could probably recognize in the movie Sucker Punch. Stepmom is about a terminally ill woman Uh, who's dealing with her ex-husband's new uh, younger lover, who will be their children's stepmother. So basically, Susan Sarandon's character was married to Ed Harris's character, Luke and Jackie. And they got a divorce as the years passed, uh, three years ago, current to what the movie is based on. Uh, Luke met Isabel, who is Julia Roberts, And uh, they start a romance. They fall in love, but Luke comes with baggage. Two amazing children, Anna and Ben. So Julie Roberts' character, Isabella, has to learn to be a mom. But she's shortly given no choice when Susan Sarandon's character, Jackie, gets terminally ill with cancer. Um, As the time passes and they find out that Jackie has cancer... Isabella starts to really form a relationship with the children and acts as a stepmom. And Jackie and Isabella work together with Jackie knowing well that in the end, one day she is going to pass real soon and that Isabella has to pick up the torch. And that's basically how the movie is. And at the end, it ends on Christmas and they're opening gifts. And Jackie finally sees that Isabella has lived up to the role of being a stepmom. The movie was was okay. It was good. It's not something I would personally watch. I'm not that kind of sentimental type of person to to watch. You know, I, I wouldn't even consider this as what you would call like a chick flick or anything. It's just a very, to me, it was very sad and happy at the same time. But it it is a good movie to watch in the fall. It's a, it really makes you think you know, of your own life. It makes you think of what you can do. But yeah, I guess it's an okay, one to 10, I'll give it a five. I'll give it definitely a five. That low. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I will tell you, I love Susan Sarandon. She's an amazing actress, loved her and whatever happened to baby Jane, the feud, loved all that. But um, it was just too sentimental. And my, my taste. Yeah, that's not your, your taste. That's kind of why I chose it, too, because I wanted to, like, show you a movie you may, may not have would ever see. Maybe you could take something from it. Yeah, it's definitely a movie I've heard of, and there's a lot of references of Stepmom, but it's not a movie that I would have sat and watched. Yeah, makes sense. 
because you love horror movies like fantasy movies those types of things so yeah I mean I watched this movie a few years ago for the first time I think it was again when I was looking up my autumn list I had this thing where I'm I'm very festive so when it, it comes to seasons I'll look up movies to watch in the seasons and movies I've seen and movies I haven't seen to kind of give them a try I also do this with my favorite actors and their movies I'll like go through all their movies that they've ever been in to introduce myself to other things or that was how I watched this movie I, I like dramas like I love drama tv I love sentimental things especially um just a movie like this where it's about losing a parent and I lost a parent at a young age so I kind of know how those kids were feeling at the time and having to go through uh just you know losing my dad and then my mom having a companion after that she never got remarried but I kind of understood sort of where those kids were coming from and I think it, the beauty of it just really showed that you don't always have to look at something as your competition. You don't always have to look at another person as someone who's going to take something from your life. You kind of have to look at it as someone who's going to give something to you and, and, and bring something to your life. And in this case, the, the ex-wife didn't have a, have a choice. The kids didn't have a choice. It was the father and the ex-husband's choice of this new woman in his life. And yes, she's a lot younger. So right there is just you kind of judge in a way um and you think well she's not even mature enough to be a mom and she has this this fancy photography career and she just is totally different from the ex-wife and she does have flaws but it i think it also shows that the ex-wife has flaws as well because she had a hard time accepting this woman and the woman was trying and and then eventually they came together at the end and i think it was just like a beautiful way of showing that that can happen because there's so many divorced families in the world or just people who never got married and and eventually split and they have kids always you hear about so many stories of just that conflict between the exes and the new people in their life and and I just think this shows that it is possible to to make it a beautiful thing and a a good thing especially given the circumstances where she unfortunately was going to pass away didn't actually show her passing away the movie but she was getting pretty close to that point and I think just I love the end the very last scene I love when she puts her hand on Julia Roberts character's shoulder for them to take a photo as a family and before it was just you know she would never ask her to be in the photos but that last scene she she asked her to come over and she's very shocked and she's like oh my gosh and it was kind of like okay this is the acceptance of the ex-wife who's gonna die soon that was enough for her to be like yeah, she's accepting me to take over the role as a mom. She like puts her hand on hers and I thought that was really sweet and very, very emotional (laughs) Uh, at the end. I think it was the perfect way to end it. And I like how they didn't really show her dying. I don't think that was necessary. I think they got the point across without showing that. So thank you, Tony, for watching it and giving it a chance. Thank you for sharing the movie with me. Yeah, I think it was fun to to watch each other's movies. So now for the moment of truth, uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get Derek's take on both of the movies, and he's gonna choose uh, one he liked the best. Now we're not winning anything for this choice; it's just for fun. But it'll be interesting to see which one he chooses, because I could see Derek liking. I don't know about you, Tony, but I could see Derek relating to both of these movies, because he likes that whole Halloween vibe movie, and then I no, maybe he could relate to the movie I gave him, given his background. So we'll see. So Derek, take it away. Yeah, so I guess I'll start with Practical Magic, since that was the first one that you guys uh, named. And the one thing that I liked about it was the witch aspect to it, because it gives me that Halloween type of vibe, which I like. Not Even though it's not a horror movie, it, it's along the same lines. In fact, it kind of reminded me uh, a little bit like a PG chick flick version of the craft in which we talked about earlier which is a movie that i do really enjoy so that gets some bonus points for me for that i also liked how at the end i know i'm kind of comparing it to horror movies but that's what i love it, it they had like a i don't know, say pg again but like a pg version of an exorcism if you kind of want to call it that where the one sister was possessed uh, by the guy that they killed and you wouldn't really call it an exorcism because it wasn't a religious thing but it it kind of reminded me of that so i like that too And then there was a scene in the movie that I can't remember who said it or when it was, but someone came up and said something like, I have a bone to pick with you or whatever. And it made me think of the real world scene, which made me laugh, which 
may not be relevant to any other people, but I got a kick out of it. <laughs> Dan and Melissa <laughs> yeah. from real world to uh, Miami on the <laughs> infamous fight on the stairs. <laughs> um, some of the things that I disliked, though, was that it was pretty slow at first, which I get that you have to build up kind of the story and what's going to happen, but it just kind of felt like it dragged a little bit, but then it picks up like halfway through whenever they kill the boyfriend or whatever he is to the one sister. And then it kind of just keeps going down from there. Not downhill, but like, you know, it picks up pretty heavily after that. I also hated the fact there was a damn tarantula at the end of the movie because I have bad arachnophobia and that I could have done without that. It was the worst thing in the world. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I guess would call it a dislike, but it's the fact that it was kind of more of a kid's movie. Not like young kid, but it's one of those like preteen type of movies that if you see it when you're younger and have a lot of nostalgia for it, like I do with Halloween Town, it probably would like it a lot more uh, if you saw it then. Like I'm sure Tony probably saw it when he was a bit younger. Maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like those type. No, no. OK, I s- no, 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 no. I saw that when it came out in movie theaters, skipping school, because once I saw Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock and Stalker Channing, I was all about that. How old were you, though, in 98? We were young. I was I was in seventh grade. Yeah, so you were young enough for that nostalgia. Yeah. yeah. It was right around the yeah. age. Yeah, like, if I see, like, Practical Magic anywhere, I'm gonna watch it. No matter if it's fall or not, it's just... It, it, it's that nostalgia. It's a really... Yeah. In my eyes, it's a really good movie. That's like me with Halloween Town, for sure. So, yeah, I wouldn't really call it a dislike, but it is one of those movies that if you saw it when you were younger, there's nostalgia. You're going to love it. If you see it when you're an adult like me, it's still a good movie, but it's not going to have the same impact that it would. And now I'll move on to Stepmom. The one thing that I liked about that movie when I first saw that Jenna Malone was going to be one of the main actresses in there, I just it was a big bonus for me because she was in a movie called Bastard out of Carolina that I remember watching, and she did a fantastic job in that, especially for her age. So I was impressed off the get-go with her, and I was excited to see another one with her in it. And then her little brother, I don't know who he was, but he was also a cute little kid, too, that was pretty good acting. He was pretty funny for being such a young kid, which I really enjoyed. And another thing, there's another scene that stood out in this movie, much like one did in uh, Practical Magic, was when I think it was the little boy was running down the stairs for something and kept saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. It re- it reminded me of the scene that I always talk about with Aaron and uh, Stranger Things where Dustin is like trying to feed the baby Demogorgon. I don't know how much you want me to say in here, but he keeps going, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. It just reminded me of that. But <laughs> and then another thing that I really enjoyed, because this kind of obviously was something that was personal to me, but the song that they played. Uh, whenever they were like dancing in the car, I think with the stepmom at first and then with their real mother uh, in the bedroom, they played Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which <laughs> ironically was like a song that me and my mom always really loved because it was in Remember the Titans, which is both one of our favorite, well, my favorite and one of her favorite movies that we would watch all the time as a kid. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I also really like how they flip flop back and forth with who they're trying to portray as the one that's trying. So at first the kids hate the stepmom or the future stepmom i guess and love their real mom obviously and then once their future stepmom tries to show that she's gonna care and try and put in some effort the mom hates that and resents that and goes and sabotages her plan to take them to i think a pearl jam concert where she ends up buying the tickets for herself to go with her children after she tells the live-in girlfriend whatever you want to call her that no it's a school night you can't go she's just trying to do it despite her so I like that. And then I think by the end, you know, you're kind of they're both trying and both giving the effort. And I think that is a big part of the story. You know, you feel empathy for one at the start for obvious reasons. And then they kind of flip flop back and forth to show that there's positives and negatives to both sides. One of the things that I disliked, though, was that at least for me, I thought it was kind of predictable of what the plot was going to be. Once you started to find out that she was sick and going to treatment, I just instantly knew I was like, oh, this is going to be about. Obviously, they hate the stepmom. She hates her and she's going to hate her till the end until she finally, you know, I don't want to call it co-parents, but passes the baton almost as she's going to die. And I just it was very, very predictable. I instantly knew that what it was going to be, but I still liked how they told it. So it didn't really take away from it that much um, because it was a really good story. And the like I said, the tale of deception kind of and screwing the stepmom over, but then 
you know, just flip flopping back and forth. Like I said, I also I know you said, Aaron, that you liked this about it. I don't know if I liked it or disliked it, but not showing her death at the end. I think it would have been a lot more impactful for obvious reasons, but I also think that it wasn't necessary. So I it wasn't a positive, wasn't a negative, but I kind of wouldn't mind. But I'm like that with movies. I like for there to be a super tragic end or something that hits you really hard and not just a typical happy ending, which this had both. It was kind of a happy ending, but you knew it was going to lead up. So maybe that is kind of the right route to go in that aspect. I think the reason I like that is because it really let you focus on the relationship between the mother and the stepmother instead of all about her death. And I think that was the point. But yeah, I could see how showing it would be impactful as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And I do like the the kind of the image at the end where, you know, they take the family photo and she says, well, how about one with the whole family? And then she's Julia Roberts' character is like, oh, that's so sweet, like shocked at first, but then kind of hesitant, but then accepting at the end. And it wraps up just like that. Yeah. And I that just hits me in the heart. And then I, I don't know how you felt about this, but the the line she says to her also was really memorable where the mother says, you know, I had their past and now you have their future. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. And then another one where uh, Julia Roberts said that my biggest fear is that I think she's talking about the daughter's going to be at her wedding day and come that time she's going to say, I wish my mom was here. And then the mom says, that's my biggest fear is that she won't say that. Yes, so, yes. Like that aspect, that's, yeah. yeah, it shows both. And a lot of people, that's why it's like, yeah, coming together. It shows both sides. And that's what I really liked about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for the moment of truth, which one I liked more, like I said, there were aspects that I liked from both movies. There were some things that I didn't like from both. I think I know what his favorite <laughs> okay, is. Okay, well, we'll let him. What do you, well, I'm curious. What do you guys think each? I don't know what you guys I think, think first. I think it was Stepmom just for the fact that it was a longer discussion. Uh, I was kind of gearing toward mm-hmm. that as well, just because he seemed to have more dislikes than the other movie. <laughs> But yeah, we'll, so we'll it, let him. Pers- I definitely, I will put, I'll put my money on stepmom. Well, no, your money's supposed to be with practical magic. That's the whole point. Well, I'm not gonna put your money on movie something. Movie versus at. my movie. <laughs> okay. No, I'm not gonna put my money on that. No, because you know you're Go gonna ahead, lose. Dad, tell us it's stepmom. Well, no. Well, I enjoy my movie, so that's what matters. Right. I don't care. No, what he well, yeah, that's why. I just- <laughs> But if, if, if I'm a betting person, if I'm a betting person, obviously I'm going to bet on stepmom. All right, drum roll. Derek, which one did you like more? Well, the one that I liked more was indeed stepmom. Uh, <laughs> it yeah. was just more of a movie that I would watch in my own time. Because like I said, it, it, Practical Magic was good. I enjoyed them both. Since Tony gave a ranking out of 10, uh, if I had to rank them, I'd say Practical Magic was like a five and a half stepmom, like seven and a half kind of around there it's not that I didn't far love either far. yeah yeah no they they didn't one didn't wasn't significantly better or worse than the other it was just stepmom was more of something that i may watch in my own free time it would take something like a recommendation but because i usually just watch horror movies but if someone said it was a super sad story that might make you cry i'll be interested in <laughs> to see so and do you find that you're more likely to watch movies if they're relatable when it's not a horror, because obviously horror is not really relatable unless you're in a terrible situation. <laughs> but, um, you know, like for <laughs> for this one where you had practical magic, obviously you're not going to relate to being a witch. Whereas you had the stepmom yeah, situation. As far as you know. Right. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, because I like it just really depends. As long as it sounds like a good story from the description, like John Q, it's not really relatable at all, but. I remember just kind of sitting down and watching that and not being able to look away, so. True. Cool. Well, thank you for watching both of them, Derek. And thank you for giving us your take. You maybe see it from a different perspective as well. Yeah, thanks for recommending them. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, some autumn recipes. We each chose uh, uh, one of our favorite recipes that we enjoy in the autumn that we wanted to share with you guys. We're going to leave the exact recipe in the description for this episode, and I'll make sure to, you know, post it on social media, all of that. But we're going to talk to you about what we chose, why you should try it, and hopefully it becomes part of your autumn tradition on the food list. I will start off with the one I chose. I chose, now this one has no sentimental meaning to me whatsoever. 
Um, but I made it for the first time last year and I absolutely loved it. It was just one of those things where I was looking for good autumn recipes online and I found this one on a food website and it is apple cider chicken. You're taking some apples and sweet potatoes and you have some chicken thighs and apple cider and honey, mustard, butter, all that good stuff and you're making it into this dish. You have some rosemary sprigs uh, it's just delicious. I'm telling you, it's just, I don't know, I made it and, and it smells delicious. It gives that autumn vibe and, and it's just something I tried and it was a hit. So you guys should try it out. It'll be in the description. As I said, juicy apple cider chicken for fall season. It's actually technically called apple cider glazed chicken thighs, but I guess you can make it with any kind of, any chicken part. So yeah try it out if you try it let me know let me know what you think if you like chicken i guarantee you will like this because it's delicious tony what did you uh, choose for your recipe a tradition in your family right yes the recipe that i picked is actually a tradition that we've had every thanksgiving and sometimes christmas dinner as well um it's called a uh, green junk and yeah it's really not junk. It's 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 okay. <laughs> but my grandmother used to make it all the time, and we all ate it. Um, you just need some green Jello, a uh, pineapple juice with the pulp, and you know get a Jello mold. Usually she used like a wreath mold, like this old old mold, and uh, you use cream cheese, two cups of water, a lot more pineapple juice, and then whipped cream. Mix it all together. Put it in the mold, put it in the fridge, leave it in there for a couple of hours, usually overnight. And then once you get it out of the mold, you garnish with uh, cherries. And that is green junk. <laughs> it's actually really good. And you would think that it would be served as like a dessert, but no, it's literally deserved next to the turkey. That's amazing. And how long have you been eating it for? Like when you were a kid? So, yeah, since I was a kid. It's always been on the table every year every thanksgiving sometimes christmas was it something your nana made up or did she get it from somewhere i have no idea but the recipes i got were written out so i don't know if she made it up but um they she said i remember her saying that the recipe is older than her so no idea all right nana's green junk <laughs> Sounds bad. It does. Uh, it's yeah. It's definitely. Well, I mean, it sounds no worse than dirt or was it cat litter or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's just it could be a funny name. They have they have weird names for things like what what is that called reindeer poop? Yeah, yeah. And it's really check mix and stuff. Well, did you yeah. guys come up with the name green junk or was that just, just was it always there? Um, I think it's just called a Jello mold, but we just call it green junk, and I think it just stuck. That's basically what Thanksgiving dinners was like. Can we have some green junk? And yeah. Awesome. So everyone, try the green junk. Let Tony know what you think. Because I'm going to give his information out at the end of the episode. And if anything, do it for Nana. She was a wonderful woman. She passed away last year. She was a wonderful woman. And we want to keep her green junk legacy going on. So let's do it. All right. Derek, what did you choose? I chose a pretty cliche dish for this time of year, but it is pumpkin pie, which I think is easily one of, if not the best dessert of all time. I'm not the biggest fan of pie, especially like fruity pies, apple pies, okay. Blueberry pie, cherry pie, they're just not my favorite desserts, um, but pumpkin pie I think is fantastic. And a lot of people just buy a pumpkin pie from the store, but it's just not the same as a homemade pumpkin pie, so that's why I chose this one. It's one that uh, I think both my mom and grandmother make it the same way just a little bit differently. They essentially just get the recipe off of the Libby's pumpkin pie or pumpkin, whatever the can is, and the recipe is on there. So it does require Libby's pumpkin mix or raw pumpkin, whatever's in those things, but you can use another brand. I don't think it would matter that much. The thing that I think makes it stand out from other pumpkin pies I have is they put a little bit, and I don't know if this calls for it in the recipe or if they just add it themselves, I kind of forget, but they put brown cinnamon on top I believe and I think my grandmother does it like while it's baking and it just adds a nice cinnamony flavor to it that just makes it better than any other pumpkin pie cinnamon mini 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 <laughs> cinnamony it's my new word just like halloweeny <laughs> it sounds delicious 
That would be like an influencer. Oh, yeah. That sounds delish. Oh, God. I think it's important, which you could put in the recipe, too, uh, to put, like, tin foil over the crust, I think. That way it doesn't, like, burn in the oven, because that could easily happen. Which I'm not a big fan of the crust, anyway. I like the bottom part to give it some structure, but back pieces I can go without. Yeah. Mm, so, a pumpkin pie. Are we calling it anything special? No, I mean, there's never been no name for it. I guess just a Libby's pumpkin pie. Give them a shout out. How about out we call it the, the recipe. Derek's pumpkin pie for this podcast All right. and for the description. We'll do that, then. that way we can decipher it from other pumpkin pies. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you can come up with a name by the time this episode airs. Like a, yeah, maybe. <laughs> like a very. I challenge you actually to come up with a very distinct <laughs> name for this recipe because you're going against green junk. I mean, come on. <laughs> this is true. Man, does green junk at that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so make Derek's pumpkin pie and let him know what you think about it. Maybe it'll replace the pumpkin pie you use every Thanksgiving, unless it's your grandmother's and she's going to kill you if you do. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yeah, no problem. And speaking of autumn-themed food, we've all been enjoying autumn snacks for this recording of this podcast because uh, we wanted to be festive and in the mood and and it's officially autumn now so we're all excited i actually bought these or had these delivered these cupcakes they're autumn cupcakes that are made into the frosting is made to look like flowers like a bouquet of all autumn colors and it looks really like like flowers <laughs> it doesn't even look like a cupcake so i'm eating that right now and it's delicious Uh, What are you enjoying, Tony? I also have my pumpkin spice uh, coffee in my pumpkin mug. Right now I'm nibbling on the um, maple leaf cookies you sent us. Oh yeah, I sent you guys cookies if you guys haven't tried them. They're maple leaf cream cookies, so they have like maple cream on the inside. Yeah, and unlike other maple stuff, you know how like they make the maple bacon donuts and like yeah you know they put maple on everything usually the maple is very overpowering and it's strong no these are an actual perfect balance and i really do enjoy them yeah they're absolutely fantastic they're made with real maple syrup they're not like generic maple flavored chemical induced stuff (laughs) it's like real maple syrup which i think is key because it makes it not too sweet but yet just sweet enough yeah and it's also really good to dip in Two different types of drinks that I've been drinking tonight, actually. The uh, tea, I forget which brand it is. I think it's like Trader Joe's. It's like cinnamon and ginger, I believe. You dip into them and it's really good. And then also the pumpkin spice coffee that I've been drinking. It's really good in that as well. The Nut Pods pumpkin spice creamer, which has no sugar in it. It's dairy free, which I need because I'm lactose intolerant. But yeah, it's really good, isn't it, Derek? It's like just the right amount of sweetness you can't even tell there's no sugar in it yeah i mean it is okay on its own i definitely like stuff a little bit sweeter so i had a bit but i will say this one out of the other nut pods that i've tried needs the least amount of sugar it's just the more naturally sweet i don't know if it's because of that pumpkin is so distinct more so than like vanilla or marshmallow or the other ones like that but yeah definitely doesn't need as much yeah i think i'm see i'm the type of person i don't put sugar in my coffee or tea uh, I usually, when I drink coffee, it's either black or I'll put a little bit of dairy-free creamer in there, or oat milk or something like that. Uh, so if I have nut pods, it's great. But Derek, I know you like sugar in your stuff, so it can be a little different if you are that type of person who likes to put sugar in your coffee. But I'm telling you, give it a try. Even if you have to add a little bit of sugar, it's really good. Uh, and yeah, so I sent these guys these autumn-themed packages with snacks and stuff as a thank you for being on the podcast. And Tony, did you try your toasted marshmallow nut pod creamer yet? No, I have not. It's still in the fridge, but I'm planning on using it in a little bit later because I'm going to make myself another hot cocoa. The salted caramel hot cocoa from Swiss Miss that you sent. Yeah. I... That is amazing. I thought you would like it because you like hot chocolate. Yeah, it's really good, and the salted caramel is, again, not overpowering. Because some some companies do that. They put, like, way too much into it, and you're like, what is this? But this was really good. And I put one of those peeps you got me, the little cat peep. I think I sent you a picture as the marshmallow in my hot cocoa from earlier today. Yeah, that's awesome. I would never even think to do that. That's cool. 
Yeah, that would be good. I was actually thinking of saving, which I didn't. I just finished the peep as well, but I was going to make a s'more with the peep. I've never done that before, and I think that would be pretty good. A little too much sugar, maybe. But... Oh, yeah, that would be good. See, I opened the cat ones up, but the, the Dia de los Muertos ones are on my shelf. I can't eat those. Those are too pretty Yeah, to I gave eat. Tony. So they're right next to my sugar skulls. I gave Derek pumpkin and Frankenstein peeps, and I gave you cats and skulls. I figured based on what you guys like. <laughs> yeah, like when I was when I was pulling the peep out, I was looking at my little black cat and I'm, I'm like, look, it's you. Look, it's you. And she's just like, whatever. And then I put it in the hot cocoa and she was terrified after that. <laughs> no, don't put her in the hot cocoa. <laughs> yeah, and I got you guys cozy autumn blankets. I have this autumn blanket. It's, it's white and it has all these orange and red and yellow leaves and it's so cute. And I got it for them as well because I love it. And yeah, I we're... actually got mine wrapped around me right now. <laughs> yeah, I have mine like on like a cape and I have to hide it from the cats <laughs> because they own every blanket in the house, but it's so soft. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we'll put in the description some of these things that you guys have. So if, in case other people want to get them. Yeah, definitely. The the maple cookies, it's from Gold Emblem. Yeah, it's a CBS Very good. brand. Maple actually. leaf cream cookies. Because they had... Oh, see, I didn't know well, that. They have other brands that are probably just as good, but they didn't have them uh, in stock yet when I got them. Only CVS did. And CVS has pretty good stuff when it comes to certain foods. So, yeah. Well, I hope they have them here in the CVS in Boston because I guess I'm going to be picking these up I more. love how you guys yeah, like them. Yeah, they're honestly <laughs> one of the best cookies I had. Because I've been eating no, those for I years. because I love Oreos. You guys didn't know what you were missing, yeah, I've, see? Oh. <laughs> They, if you like Oreos, you'll probably like them, too, because they remind me. I mean, if you don't like maple, you're probably not going to like these. But if you do and you like Oreos, it's it. Yeah, it's basically like a maple Oreo and it's so good. Yeah, and it's perfect fall flavor. Autumn yummies. Yeah, I'm pretty much done with my food, but now I'm sipping on my drinks. But yeah, Tony, let me know what you think when you try the toasted marshmallow, because it makes your coffee taste like a s'more. Oh, definitely. Um, but I also want to say, too, on the cookies, it says, I think the nutrition facts are lying because it says serving sizes, too. But we're just going to ignore that. <laughs> yeah, I tried my best <laughs> to make a blast till today. I did. But those last four I had did not last very long. <laughs> I actually had the uh, the mac and cheese earlier, too, which I didn't finish yet. It's like, what's that brand? It's like that vegan Annie's. Organic, organic brand. Yeah, yeah. Annie's. And uh it's not like traditional mac and cheese. It has, I think, pumpkin and... Sweet potato. Sweet potato, yeah, powder. And it's definitely interesting. It's not the greatest thing I've ever had, but it's also not bad. It's... I don't even know how to describe it. It almost has like an earthy taste, kind of, which sounds gross, but it's not. It's... Yeah, I think the pumpkin is a little more dominant than the sweet potato. Do you know why it's earthy taste? Because on the box, there's a rabbit on it. The rabbits made that oh mac and cheese. <laughs> that's that's Anne. <laughs> there you go hmm what are you smoking a lot so if this conversation doesn't make you want to curl up with your autumn blanket and get your autumn yummies and drinks and all of that then i don't know what will but you need to do it now if you haven't already because it's autumn and that's the reason we're recording this episode and that's the celebration so get with it i'm just kidding <laughs> fucking attitude <laughs> Get with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I love this is my favorite season, so I'm excited. I'm giddy. I'm happy to be doing this. Let's keep going. It's giveaway time. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? No, I'm excited. So I put out a post, uh, multiple posts, actually, about a giveaway where I'm giving away. I guess it's a podcast promo package it'll include podcast merchandise as well as autumn themed goodies like snacks and drinks and whatever else i'm gonna put in there i haven't decided quite yet but it's gonna be a lot like the ones i sent derek and tony and they can vouch that it's a really good package but yeah we have some entries and derek is actually gonna draw the name i do I have them all in a hat right here i don't know if you can hear them but no cheating <laughs> I'm so used to drawing the names in uh, the other giveaways, so I thought it'd be fun to have the guest actually draw the name this time. All right, so mix them up, Derek. No, I'm mixing. They're going to be mixed good. <laughs> no peeking. You tell me when to stop, and then I'll draw. Maybe I should make you wait for a while. 
<laughs> I was going to say, how long are you going to do this? <laughs> I can hear it mixing. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about now? All right. I got one. Let's see. Do we want an imaginary drum roll? Do we let this go on for a little bit? Build the suspense? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However you want to do it. All right. When you're so ready. I have a winner. And I'll see the winner is. I'm not even going to look at it. I think I saw it through the thing, but the winner of the <laughs> podcast giveaway is Liv Churchman. Nice. So okay. Congratulations to Liv. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations, Liv. I believe she entered on Instagram. I don't know who she is, but hey, it's cool when strangers, you know, kind of enter because it's it's more exciting that way. It introduces a podcast to new people, and it's just fun. So, Liv, I will reach out to you for your address, and I will be sending that autumn package your way. Yeah, be so, sure to share the podcast Thank around. you so much for entering. Yeah, and we might do another giveaway in another future-themed episode coming up. I don't want to give it away just yet, unless you're the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> That's a really bad joke. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. But <laughs> okay, congratulations to Liv. Thank you so much for entering again. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. That'll be headed your way soon. All right, so on to the next segment. Now, this special segment, uh, we couldn't do an autumn-themed episode without mentioning Halloween. So, of course, Halloween is one of the holidays that takes place in the autumn. Thanksgiving is the other. Yeah, since I'm with these horror fanatics, um, we wanted to do a special spooky segment in honor of Halloween, and that's what this is. And we actually didn't intend to do this, but it just happened this way. We are all going to talk about different historical spooky topics that are all true. And they actually just all ended up taking place in Massachusetts, where Tony and I are from. So this is a Massachusetts-themed spooky segment. So for all you mass holes out there. (laughs) Is that what you guys call each other? (laughs) No, no, we Ohio don't call each other so that. Much better. <laughs> yeah, we're, we don't call each other that anymore. We're Bostonians. Bostonians. Okay. Well, I've been out of Massachusetts too long. <laughs> right? Don't we're cut. We're cutting that out. <laughs> Mass holes not going in here. Please don't do that to me. <laughs> For all you Bostonians out there, slash mass holes. Uh, no. <laughs> don't do. Th- oh, God, I'm going to walk away. <laughs> Tony is very proud of his Massachusetts heritage. He's very, like, pro-mass, whereas I'm just like, yeah, I'm from Massachusetts, but nothing to it with my best Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible. You've been away too long. That That's fine. You get a pass for that. Call us masshole again, though. <laughs> So yeah, we have these three different spooky topics. One of them is uh, some Massachusetts spooky history. The other one is a paranormal topic. And then the third is a true crime topic. So I'm going to start it off with the historical topic. And I'm going to talk to you about the Salem witch trials, which took place in Salem, Massachusetts, way back when. Now, I had heard of the Salem witch trials. I knew a little bit about it being from Massachusetts. You're taught about it in school sometimes, but I didn't really dig deep into it until I did some research here. So get your coffee and your treat and get ready to listen to some cool historical facts about Massachusetts. So I'm going to read about the Salem Witch Trials. This is from Smithsonian Magazine, and I'm just going to talk to you about what it was, what happened, why it became popular, all of that. So the Salem Witch Trials occurred in colonial Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693. More than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft, called the Devil's Magic, and 20 were executed. Eventually, the colony admitted the trials were a mistake and compensated the families of those convicted. Since then, the story of the trials has become synonymous with paranoia and injustice, and it continues to take on the popular imagination more than 300 years later. Basically, several centuries ago, many practicing Christians and those of other religions had a strong belief that the devil could give certain people, known as witches, the power to harm others in return for their loyalty. 
So a quote-unquote witchcraft craze rippled through Europe from the 1300s to the end of the 1600s. Tens of thousands of supposed witches, mostly women, were executed. Though the Salem trials came on just as the European craze was winding down, local circumstances explained their onset. In 1689, English rulers William and Mary started a war with France and the American colonies. Known as King William's War to Colonists, it ravaged regions of upstate New York, Nova Scotia, and Quebec, sending refugees into the county of Essex, and specifically Salem Village in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, Salem Village is present-day Danvers, Massachusetts. Colonial Salem Town became what's now Salem. The displaced people created a strain on Salem's resources. This aggravated the existing rivalry between families with ties to the wealth of the Port of Salem and those who still depended on agriculture. Controversy also brewed over Reverend Samuel Paris, who became Salem Village's first ordained minister in 1689, and he was disliked because of his rigid ways and greedy nature. The Puritan villagers believed all the quarreling was the work of the devil. In January of 1692, Reverend Paris's daughter Elizabeth, who was nine at the time, and niece Abigail Williams, who was 11, started having quote-unquote fits. They screamed through things, uttered peculiar sounds, and contorted themselves into strange positions. And a local doctor blamed the supernatural. There was another girl named Anne Putnam. She was 11. She experienced similar episodes. On February 29th, under pressure from magistrates, Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorne, the girls blamed three women for afflicting them. Tichuba, the Paris's Caribbean slave, Sarah Good, a homeless beggar, and Sarah Osborne, an elderly, impoverished woman. Now, all three women were brought before the local magistrates and interrogated for several days, starting on March 1st, 1692. Osborne claimed innocence, as did Good, but Tichaba confessed, the devil came to me and bid me serve him. That's what she said. She described elaborate images of black dogs, red cats, yellow birds, and a black man, quote unquote black man, who wanted her to sign his book. She admitted that she signed the book and said there were several other witches looking to destroy the Puritans. And all three women were put in jail. With the seed of paranoia planted, a stream of accusations followed for the next few months. Charges against Martha Corey, a loyal member of the church in Salem Village, greatly concerned the community. If she could be a witch, then anyone could. Magistrates even questioned Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter Dorothy, and her timid answers were construed as a confession. The questioning got more serious in April when Deputy Governor Thomas Danforth and his assistants attended the hearings. Dozens of people from Salem and other Massachusetts villages were brought in for questioning. On May 27, 1692, Governor William Phipps ordered the establishment of a special court of lawyer uh, in Terminer for Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties. The first case brought to the special court was Bridget Bishop, an older woman known for her gossipy habits and promiscuity. When asked if she committed witchcraft, Bishop responded, I am as innocent as the child unborn. The defense must not have been convincing because she was found guilty and on June 10th became the first person hanged on what was later called Gallows Hill. Five days later, respected minister Cotton Mather wrote a letter imploring the court not to allow spectral evidence, testimony about dreams and visions. The court largely ignored this request and five people were sentenced and hanged in July, five more in August and eight in September. On October 3rd, following in his son's footsteps, Increase Mather, then president of Harvard, denounced the use of spectral evidence. It were better that ten suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. Governor Phipps, in response to Mather's plea, and his own wife being questioned for witchcraft, prohibited further arrests, released many accused witches, and dissolved the court of lawyer and terminer on October 29th. Phipps replaced it with the Superior Court of Judicature, which disallowed spectral evidence and only condemned three out of 56 defendants. Phipps eventually pardoned all who were in prison on witchcraft charges by May 1693, but the damage had been done. 19 were hanged on Gallows Hill, a 71-year-old man was pressed to death with heavy stones, several people died in jail, and nearly 200 people overall had been accused of practicing quote-unquote the devil's magic. 
So following the trials and executions, many involved, like Judge Samuel Sewall, publicly confessed error and guilt. On January 14, 1697, the general court ordered a day of fasting and soul-searching for the tragedy of Salem. In 1702, the court declared the trials unlawful, and in 1711, the colony passed a bill restoring the rights and good names of those accused and granted restitution to their heirs. However, it was not until 1957, more than 250 years later, that Massachusetts formally apologized for the events of 1692. So that's basically the backstory of the Salem Witch Trials. Um, you know, in the 20th century, it says artists and scientists alike continue to be fascinated by this. Playwright Arthur Miller resurrected the tale with his 1953 play, The Crucible, uh, using the trials as allegory for the McCarthyism paranoia in the 1950s. Additionally, numerous hypotheses have been devised to explain the strange behavior that occurred in Salem in 1692. One of the most concrete studies published in Science in 1976 by psychologist Linda Caporel, Caporel blamed the abnormal habits of the accused on the fungus ergot, which can be found in rye, wheat, and other cereal grasses. Toxicologists say that eating ergot contaminated foods can lead to muscle spasms, vomiting, delusions, and hallucinations. Also, the fungus thrives in warm and damp climates not too unlike the swampy meadows in Salem Village, where rye was a staple grain during the spring and summer months. Now in August 1992, to mark the 300th anniversary of the trials, Nobel laureate Ellie Weasel dedicated the Witch Trials Memorial in Salem. Also in Salem, the Peabody Essex Museum houses the original court documents, or Peabody, how they say it in Massachusetts, houses the original court documents and the town's most visited attraction, the Salem Witch Museum, attests to the public's enthrallment within 1692 hysteria. So yeah, you had that, and then, of course, there's been many television shows and movies based on the Salem Witch Trials. Derek didn't uh, American Horror Story touched on that as well, one of their seasons. Yeah, I don't know if it was necessarily the Salem Witch Trials specifically. Tony would be able yeah, to answer that better. Yeah, it was. Okay. It was in, in American Horror Story Coven. It was the remaining witches that were conv uh, convicted. They made passage, kind of like a pilgrimage to Louisiana to rehome themselves. Yeah, so it's very interesting. And, you know, I know that... Salem is a, is a tourist attraction whenever someone visits Massachusetts, especially around Halloween, right, Tony? Like, everyone wants to go to Salem. Yeah. Don't they have festivals? From what festivals? I remembered, yes, they do. They do have festivals. From what I remember, again, this is 2022, um, but beforehand, it would be kind of like a Mardi Gras for people for Halloween. And a little fun fact, too, Massachusetts actually has an official witch of Massachusetts. Her name is Lori Cabot. And she resides in Salem. She has a shop there that's called the Crow and Cat, I believe. The Crow, the Crone, the Cat, and the Raven, or something like that. But yeah, Salem. Like when you go to Salem, even if you look out, you know, like the the street. You know, uh, what is it called? You know how they paint the lines in the street? Like the the white lines. The For white the lines. They're orange. Yeah, they're orange there. From the last time I've been there, it's been a while. Again, this is after, you know, the whole COVID thing, so I don't know how they do it now. But, like, the stop signs, like, when it's painted stop on the ground or a bus stop, there was, like, a witch on a broom painted there. Oh, cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like handicap spots used to have witch hats on. So Salem is very apologetic, and it's actually a safe haven for anybody who is, you know, in between Wiccan or paganism and everything in between. Now, do you think there must be some people who see that as a mockery almost, right? As opposed to, like, a tribute? Well, what do you mean? Since all these people were executed for thinking they were witches and stuff, like, like they're basically signif oh, you mean a, signifying... Like a festival? Well, like, they're basically signifying what these people were killed for no we pay tribute on that day we pay tribute on that day and everything that salem has ever done after the fact was be remorseful and basically anybody who was wiccan pagan and everything in between you know flocked to that area and they kind of like if you want anything you know witchery 
you would go there and Salem just kind of adapted to it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a mockery either the festival that they have cuz I'm saying like it could almost be seen in some people's eyes as like disrespectful that you're having like a festival oh. for all these people who got executed, you know. All that. Well, here's the thing though. In the Wiccan pagan religion, we celebrate the harvest and we celebrate with a festival. If anything, if you're not Wiccan or pagan or anything in between when it comes to the craft, why are you offended? <laughs> True. I'm not offended, and I'm Wiccan, so... (laughs) I mean, it's actually really beautiful, and it's kind of a safe haven now, something that used to be a horrible place years ago. Years and years and years ago, someone like me could have been burnt to the stake or hung or crushed with rocks. Now I can go there and be more accepted here than I can in Southie Boston. So what do you consider to be a witch? What's your definition? You can't defy witches. You, you You just can't. You can't define them. Everybody who practices and believes and who is one with the things around them is a witch in their own take. And it's probably, let's be honest, the most popular Halloween costume. I mean, it is, but, you know, people go through phases. I mean, nobody really dresses up like a witch anymore. I haven't seen people dressed up as a witch. You know, you know you know how this generation goes. They, they want to dress up as Harley Quinn or they want to dress up as She-Hulk or... You know, right, but all I mean, in all, like over the whole of time since this happened, I feel like there has been a lot of witch costumes. Maybe not so like much recently, but well, one. well, the thing is, though, when people dress up as a witch, they're doing it on the Hollywood perspective. Right, right, and that's I'm important a witch, to point and out. And I don't look like that. Yes. Yeah, like I'm a witch, and I don't look like that. I don't look like the witch from The Wizard of Oz. What Hollywood has deciphered as a witch isn't i mean if you want the closest resemblance of a witch watch american horror story coven that we're normal people we're nice people too yeah yeah a witch isn't like the whole ugly green face with the big nose and all of that like you said yeah that's hollywood's interpretation of a witch but yeah we're we're just normal people we just believe something differently right all right awesome so tony you're gonna talk about our paranormal topic from Massachusetts and what did you choose? Tell everybody what you're going to talk about and he's going to explain the backstory to this and all the spooky details. So basically I picked a very broad topic but I'm going to kind of go down to my opinion of it because it can be taken either way. First off, uh, we're going to be talking about the Bridgewater Triangle that's here in Massachusetts. More so on the on the south coast it goes all the way from the tip of rhode island to all the way up to new hampshire everything on the west coast does not have this here i mean on the west of massachusetts um but if you guys want to know more about it there's an amazing youtube channel called bristol county media go to them and they have a full documentary on the bridgewater triangle and they try to sum it up as well but apparently in the bridgewater triangle which goes to Brockton, to Rehoboth, to uh, Freetown, and Abington, a giant triangle which I live close to and which Erin used to live close to as well, is basically a paranormal and a supernatural hotbed, so to speak. They think it's a curse, and I believe it too. So so I'm going to go to the curse aspect of it. So back in 1675, Southeast Mast was known as Plymouth Colony, so half of Massachusetts on the coastline was called Plymouth Colony, just all as a whole. There was no Rehoboth or Brockton or anything. The Native Americans actually rebelled against the English. They were fed up with the abuse and, you know, taking over the land, forcing them to be Christians. And they started a war in 1976, and it was um, known as the King Philip's War, (laughs) which is kind of funny because the person who started this war was Matacoma. It was his war, and they just couldn't say Matacoma, so they just dubbed him as King Philip because he was the chief of that um, indigenous colony that was there. And it spread to the areas of Taunton, Dartmouth, uh, Middleborough, and Rehoboth. And during this war, there was a lot of lives lost. And really what the indigenous people of Massachusetts wanted 
was just to live in peace. They didn't want to be converted. They didn't want to share their, you know, they didn't mind sharing their land, but they just wanted to coexist. That, that was a big thing of their rebellion. So as the war continued on, he was eventually caught and he was killed. He was beheaded. And it was rumored that his head stayed on a spike on a pike, excuse me, on a pike for 20 years as a warning to other Native Americans. And they think that this is what the curse was made of, of the disrespect. Not only that, but his wife and child were sold to slavery as well. And there was no real historical evidence after them being sold into slavery. So we don't know what happened afterwards. So this all happened at the heart of the Bridgewater Triangle. So in Bridgewater Triangle in the earliest times, especially in the 2000s, there has been UFO sightings, there has been a Bigfoot sighting, <laughs> it, it really goes crazy. Um, hellhounds to giant snakes, they even have a um, kind of like a mothman, they call it a firebird or thunderbird. And these are all sightings and all documented and actually they're really documented by actual people like police officers or news reporters. Some people have had evidence of this, but there is a swamp that seems to be like the actual heart of all this paranormal activity and all these crazy things. The swamp is called the Hakama Swamp, which is also an Algonquin, Algonquin word, excuse me, that it, it, Hakamawak Swamp means place where spirits dwell. And this is the name to it today. And it actually holds up to its reputation because around the swamp, they think that there's hellhounds that are giant black and gray. There's also been uh, paranormal orbs, and there's actual videos of this as well. And uh, I think the biggest thing from this, which kind of divides it, because you can you can understand paranormal activity, ghosts, hellhounds, you know, banshees, whatever you want to call them. But where it kind of drifts is kind of the UFO sightings. So the most documented sighting of a UFO was in 1979, and the UFO was shaped as a baseball diamond except the bottom end, the flat end, was extended more. So it looked like a giant baseball diamond floating around and that was the most documented one. You really don't think about that when you think about paranormal. This is supernatural. Am I wrong? Derek, correct me if I'm wrong. The difference between paranormal and supernatural, like you don't, you can understand paranormal but supernatural is like aliens, Bigfoot, hellhounds. I guess i mean i've always kind of considered them more or less the same thing but i think yeah i think supernatural is more ghost spirit type vibe than paranormal you don't think that's kind of paranormal no see i think it's the other way i think paranormal is kind of the unexplained when i think. other than this is definitely paranormal <laughs> i don't know i because, guess it depends on your definition it this just seems to be the hotbed of everything that has happened here um the actual bridgewater triangle was actually coined by lauren coleman who wrote a book you would think i would have put the book's name down in my notes stupid and there's also this you might like this one Aaron. also in fall river near freetown the state forest there is actually a hotbed for actual activity when it comes to bigfoot do y'all believe in bigfoot i don't know i've been in the middle of watching king kong movies so i'm a little bit <laughs> i'm oh, just God. like no well <laughs> i i think I think there could have been like a creature back in the day that's kind of like a yeti type of thing, but I don't think there's like a Bigfoot out there. And I think if there ever was that type of creature, it's probably extinct. Yeah, when you normally hear about Bigfoot sightings and stuff, you would think in some national park, but no, you never think that you know, when you hear about ghost stories, that's kind of common in New England as a whole, and especially Massachusetts, but Bigfoot sightings, which I, which was new to me. There was also a lore, the Mad Trucker of Copic Road is also a lore that is also in the Bridgewater Triangle, as if you put your high beams on, on Copic Road, the Mad Trucker will push you off the road. And that's all I have for Bridgewater. There's so much information about the Bridgewater Triangle, I could not tell you all. It would be literally a whole complete three hour podcast. There's just so many documented with proof, with photos, some of them without any proof of actual things happening. But apparently the Bridgewater Triangle is the most populated area for paranormal and supernatural activity. So do you know when the, the most recent activity has been reported there? Actually, no, but I'm quite curious and I kind of want to go out there. 
like uh, we've been there before but we've been there through passing we've never been there to actually do like any kind of evidence or anything but i would like to go to the hakamuk swamp definitely would like to go there not I'd, i wouldn't go to the freetown fall river state forest because they'll never find me again I get easily turned around, but I would definitely like to go to the Hakamok Swamp. It seems like there's a lot of activity there, especially of the hellhounds, large um, black and yellow cats, and they're talking about bigger than mountain lions, because there's mountain lions there. These are bigger. Uh, giant big snakes the size of golf carts, and again, there's we actually have our own Mothman, which is also called the Thunderbird. And for those who don't know, Mothman is a supposed creature people have seen, right? Yeah, Mothman is the creature that that people saw. Usually if people saw them, something devastating happened to their city. Like they'll see the they'll see the Mothman one day and then within 24 hours something horrible will happen in their city. Overall, what do you think about the Bridgewater Triangle? Do you think there's legit reason to be scared or do you think that it's just people being paranoid or it sounds like you believe that though you believe there's some definitely some activity there oh most definitely i do believe that some things you know there could be a bigfoot there could be a mothman or a thunderbird there could be these creatures out there that we don't know about there could be change changelings around we don't know and those are things that we're never going to know not unless we actually have hardcore proof but um, people's actual, you know, documented cases on this, they swear up and down that these things have happened, and I do believe them. It's, it's kind of weird to be a human being and thinking that we're the only intelligent life form, is my thing. Like, right. we can't be that cocky as a human race to think we're it. There has to be more out yeah, there. Yeah, you know how big the universe is? It's crazy. We're just a speck in it. Yeah, and every day scientists are finding new insects, new fish, they're finding new animals out there. Maybe this is just something we haven't found yet, or something that's on the brink of extinction. I don't know, but um, I think the only thing I'm a little iffy about is the UFO thing. Like, I do believe that there's, you know, other intelligent life out there. I do believe that. Um, I just wish that there was some proof. Like, it's something I know that could be real. But I guess it's something that I've always wanted to have real proof of. Because we have a Bigfoot picture, we have a Loch Ness Monster picture, we have Changeling pictures, we have a Mothman picture, but we really don't have, we don't have a very good UFO picture. They've all been really debunked. That's true, yeah. There's so many theories about it, and yeah, you can go on and on and on, but like, it's definitely something very interesting to me, especially since we grew up around it too. It's when you're from an area like that, and to know all this alleged activity has happened there, it definitely makes you stop and think, hmm, could we have been that close to all of that? Oh, we were definitely, like, I looked at the map, we were definitely close. Like, we were literally on the border. Yeah. So, I dare to say that maybe we were in the triangle. And we have been in the triangle a lot too, traveling and stuff. Like, there's no way we haven't. Did you hear about the Bridgewater Triangle when you were a kid? Or is this something you learned about as an adult? Because I never heard about it as a kid. Well, back in like 2007, me and Josh, if you guys remember Josh from um, last year's podcast for Halloween, uh, we formed a paranormal group and it started with us going, hey, let's go see if we can, you know, we live in Massachusetts. This is where all the ghost stories come from. Why don't we go see them? And we started, you know, going to places and that's where it really picked up and we started to actually do cases. Uh, We did a Kentucky case, we did one in North Carolina, and we did one in Fort Adams, which is in, um, I think it was in Rhode Island, we did. But I definitely believe in all this. My big issue is, it's a lot going on. Do you get what I'm saying? We have UFOs, we have a Mothman, we have Bigfoot, we have a Mad Trucker, we have giant mountain lions, we have hellhounds, and a giant snake the size of a golf cart. I mean, that's a lot going on. And I feel like that's a lot going on. I wish we could actually see it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, the orbs were all caught on videotape. Um, Are you talking about just in the Bridgewater Triangle, all this stuff, or in general? Yeah, just this is just in the Bridgewater Triangle. This is all documented closely to the Hockamock Swamp. Um, 
but they also think that the Freetown Fall River area is where they had um, a lot of cult activity, meaning a lot of satanic cults went there. They really do think that it's a haunted forest and it has some strange animals in it as well but they have found evidence of you know satanic cults in there you know with their remains and stuff they found giant you know pentagrams um upside down and stuff and they you know they found all the evidence for that i but i don't think it's anything like that i think there's just stupid kids who go into the forest you know national park and you know kids everybody watches the craft and they think they're a witch do you get what i'm saying yeah yeah, like there could be legit stories and there could just be people, you know, imagining things or Yeah, the the most the most though photographic document and video recorded would have to be the spook lights. That's what they call them. There's actually a native a lore behind it that the indigenous people call them the puckwoggles. And they're apparently these beings, they're, they have a tail, I can't really describe them that much, but you can Google it. I've heard of those, yeah. Um, yeah, they, they move around like normal people, but when they want to really get by, they turn into a ball of light and they go, you know, zooming everywhere. And there's been a lot of documentation about that. And these lights, when you watch them, they're very sentient and they dance on top of the Hakamok Swamp. So there's been a lot of documents of that. It's actually really cool if you watch the videos. Again, I do no justice to this by explaining the Bridgewater Triangle, so please go to Bristol County Media on YouTube. They have amazing content, and they actually show the evidence and the proof, and they have actually the people who have had encounters. Even one man who was taking his dog for a walk, in a, and uh, you know, you know the streetlights? under the street light he found some being that i guess could be bigfoot but three foot tall pointing at him saying these words um i wrote them down but i'm not going to say them because i am not cursing myself and he thinks that the thing was telling him to come to him now and he said it in such detail that i could not not believe him does that make sense like i like he had to have been telling the truth and there's actually a drawing of the being he thinks that was talking to him so there's a lot of people who have seen a lot of stuff i mean i wouldn't mind spending a night at the swamp yeah yeah all right so anything else no that's it all right well thank you tony for that in-depth look at the bridgewater triangle in bridgewater massachusetts all right so we're gonna move on with our massachusetts spooky theme to the true crime topic and Derek's going to talk about probably, if not the most, one of the most popular murders that took place in Massachusetts, specifically Fall River, Massachusetts, where I'm from. <laughs> uh, and we definitely learned about this in school. I think every Massachusetts kid learned about this. I believe people nationally learned about this as well. Uh, and yeah, so Derek, let us know what you're going to be talking about. I'm sure everyone's heard of this if they're from Massachusetts. Yeah, I feel like even if you're not from Massachusetts, you've probably heard of it. Um, so you've heard you... of it because oh, you're yeah. not from Massachusetts. Okay, so it, so yeah, I've always been, I knew it was nationally known, but I wasn't sure like how well known since Tony and I are from Massachusetts, especially me. I'm um, from the city where this took place. So it was like drilled in our heads. I think it's interesting to know that people who are not from Massachusetts actually are well aware of this. Did you know that, Tony, that people were well aware of this outside of our state? Yeah, mostly. Oh, okay. There's been some people on my show that they're like, you're from Massachusetts. Have you heard about this? All right. So, Derek, let the listeners know what we're going to be hearing about. Yeah. So, like you said, this is probably one of the most famous or infamous uh, murders throughout history. But I think where the difference comes in and where you grew up is you guys, like you said, had a beat into your head that, you know, the history behind it. Whereas someone who has never been to Massachusetts, I always thought it was just solved and... It's not. So it is one of the most famous unsolved cases, and that's the Lizzie Borden axe murder. It's known. So the story goes, uh, at least from most people's perspective, speaking from mine, so is that Lizzie Borden killed her parents. That's basically the gist of what I knew of it, when in actuality that's, depending on what you believe is true or isn't true, because like I said, it is an unsolved case. So this took place on August 4th, 1892. So it is a very old case uh, in Fall River, Massachusetts. 
A lot of people probably have heard of the nursery rhyme, which I think is why it's gotten so popular, which is very creepy when you think about it. This is a nursery rhyme, and I read that it was like a popular thing to jump rope to, but it's Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. And I think there's a second verse to it as well, but it's just not as well known. Um, which, to start off with, that's actually not true. I guess when I was doing the research, I think the stepmother got like 18 or 17 wax, for being specific, and the father 11, but that doesn't rhyme. It didn't have a catchy tune to it, so they changed that up, I guess. So the victims in this case were Lizzie Borden's father, Andrew, and her stepmother, Abby Borden. Um, I don't know if it's another misconception that a lot of people have, or it's just me, but I always thought that they had their heads cut off. Not to get graphic here, but this is a pretty graphic case. When, in actuality, they were both bludgeoned to death. I guess I just assumed when I heard axe murder, I just, you know, cutting rather than bludgeoning, but I guess it does make more sense that way. Now, another interesting thing about this case is that the blood on the stepmother was dried and had been there for at least an hour, hour and a half, while as the father's blood was fresh and he was still warm to the touch, which confirms that he was murdered a significant time after her, at least an hour from what I've read. Now, the only people that were present in the home at the time were obviously the parents or father and stepmother and then the maid, which I think she was out doing something. I don't know if she was in the house. Um, and then both sisters, Lizzie and... Her older sister. The other people that lived in the house, like I said, were the maid and I believe their uncle, but he was out during this time. The person who discovered the bodies, which is another reason that she was a suspect, was Lizzie Borden herself. The thing that goes in her favor, though, is when she ran upstairs to scream for her sister to come down and say the father had been murdered, she had no blood on her. And given that the father was just recently murdered, you would think that there'd be some evidence of blood. I don't know if she'd have enough time to change out of it, wash the clothes, especially back in, you know, 1890s. That's, you know, have the, the cleaning supplies and the ability and washing machines and stuff like that that you do now. Another thing that people have always said was that Lizzie Borden absolutely resented and hated her stepmother, which is ironic given the movie <laughs> Stepmom that we described earlier, but... <laughs> So that was another reason that she was a big suspect. Um, and both sisters were said to be unhappy with their father because he was a very wealthy man in the city and owned buildings and would basically pay off Lizzie's kleptomaniac sprees that she would go on. She had this urge to steal stuff and father just said, put it on my tab, I'll pay for it, let her do what she wants. So the sisters were both have said to be unhappy with his unwillingness to spend the money because they did have it, so they kind of lived in a smaller house and were more modest and could definitely afford a lot more than that, which I guess upset both the sisters. So like I said, the two things that really go against Lizzie is the fact that she was the one that discovered the bodies and the fact that she had a motive, if anybody, in the house because she hated her stepmother so much, but it didn't necessarily explain why the father was killed. Another thing is that people who, I guess, lived around the house or were outside during the time said they saw no disturbances from outside, nobody breaking in, nothing like that. So it almost confirms that it had to come from inside the house in some way. So one of the people that were in there almost likely had to be the cause. The things that go in her favor for this case, like I said, is the fact that there was no evidence of blood on her, considering how gruesome and violent the crime was, and there was blood, you know, all over the murder scene she would have had to have something on her, at least on her arms, something in her hair, because the body of her father was so fresh and it just happened. The only evidence of blood she did have was on her undergarments, but she told the police that that was just her period, and they just immediately said, okay, they took her word for it, we're not going to get into that any further. However, one thing that they have admitted to messing up on is the police didn't do a thorough search of her room and her property to really look a lot further, which would have given her some time to remove any bit of evidence because they said that they just didn't feel like doing it because Lizzie said she wasn't feeling well, which is a poor excuse, but again, this was 1892, so. She was also apparently seen burning a dress shortly after this had happened, I think the next day maybe, which obviously looks very sketchy and doesn't bode well for her, but her sister defended this, saying that it was her decision to burn the dress for whatever reason. So that kind of leads me to believe that maybe there was some conspiracy going on, but no one will ever really know. She did become an official suspect in the next day, I believe, if not a couple days later, when the police returned to do an actual inspection of the house and found the hatchet head upstairs, which had been likely cleaned and burned because it was covered in ash to probably 
as an attempt to remove any bit of evidence from it. And this ended up being the weapon that they deemed responsible for the murders. The trial for the murders took place on June 5th, 1893. And surprisingly, like I said before, she was found not guilty, which I always assumed that she was guilty because that's just how the song goes, that's how the myth and legend goes, at least outside of Massachusetts, from what I understand. From what I read, this was described as a pretty massive event, uh, especially given the time that it happened and the fact that the main suspect was a woman, which wasn't very common to see women murderers back then, and was often thought of that that's impossible, they wouldn't do something like that, which as history has showed us, can absolutely be true, but I've seen it compared to the O.J. Simpson trial as well, and everyone knows how popular and publicized that was, so. So, like I said, she was found not guilty for this, and apparently there was a pretty massive support uh, waiting for her outside. I guess a lot of people were in her favor, not thinking that a woman can do this, of course. And then, surprisingly, she continued to live the rest of her life in Fall River after this had happened, which you would think that even if you were innocent, that would just be a place you'd want to get out of for memories, and no matter what, people are going to be pointing the finger at you. It doesn't matter what the verdict is, you get accused of something like that, and when a lot of evidence, or I guess lack of evidence, but more of motive and reasoning points to you, you just wouldn't want to live there, but she did, and eventually passed away on June 1st, 1927, due to pneumonia, I believe a complication from a surgery. Even today, she's still speculated by many to have been the one to kill her father and stepmother, and the house that it happened in has been turned into a bed and breakfast, which is a little weird, but if you're into that thing with the paranormal, then it's probably right up your alley. I've seen a lot of pictures of people, like, recreating the scene from the father, like, laying on the couch laughing, which I thought was pretty messed up. It just goes to show that, like, I guess in a lot of people's eyes, enough time has passed that it's... Yeah, I guess okay to joke and laugh about now, but I find that weird. Being that this is such an old case and happened in the 1800s, the lack of DNA testing and awareness to preserve the crime scene had led this case to being cold and has not been solved officially and probably never will. I guess the police also just walked through the crime scene, didn't really, you know, try to, you know, preserve anything. Like I said, this was 1892, I believe, and DNA was not really a thing. I mean, it was, but the testing was not there. You even hear of in cold cases where the testing in like the 50s and 60s isn't that good. This is the 1800s, so it was almost the perfect time for something like this to happen and go unsolved forever, because there will pretty much never be a way to actually solve it. There have been some movies created in the legend and lore of Lizzie Borden, the first one being The Legend of Lizzie Borden, ironically, I didn't mean to do that, but this was from 1975 and was actually nominated for a Golden Globe and Best Motion Picture. There's also a, a two more modern movies, one called Lizzie Borden Took an Axe from 2014, and this was described as a TV movie and supposed to be, from what I read, more of a tongue-in-cheek take on it, which I'm not quite sure what that means, but... And then the most recent one is Lizzie from 2018. So my opinion on the case is I feel like Lizzie probably did it, only because there, it almost reminds me of the Jean Benet Ramsey unsolved murder case, where it is... All signs of evidence or lack thereof point to someone from in the house having committed the crime, but there's not enough evidence to prove who did it, but there's also s logical reasons and conspiracy theories, not really conspiracy theories, but logical reasons that you could see people in the house doing it and or conspiring together to cover it up. So it's one of those things, in both cases, the, the DNA was not, you know, preserved well. So it's one of those things that if you really examine everything, you can kind of point to who is most likely to have committed the crime, but there's no way of ever knowing, and it probably never will be. Yeah, I um, thank you for that thorough description. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I think even growing up in that city and everybody always talking about it, it was always... Every, I, I feel like more people thought she did it than not. And even today, like she's buried in the same cemetery as my grandma, and they have like a whole her whole family is were buried in this one section and their headstones are there and they have like even this little trail that they actually put in the cemetery saying lizzie board and grave this way because it's so popular and there's people that still go there every day and you see all kinds of stuff on her grave and flowers and stones and and i don't know what that means but it's just people go there and it's a touristy spot and it's so weird because i don't know about you tony but i've never I've never visited the house. I've 
driven by it, just being from the city, and people would say, oh, there's the Lizzie Borden house. But it is a bed and breakfast. But I don't know anybody that's ever been in that bed and breakfast that I grew up with. And that's weird because it was one when I grew up in my teen years, all that. And I don't know if it's just because we're from the city and we just aren't interested. But that usually tends to be how it goes. Like, people who are in a city, they don't ever see the touristy stuff. But people who are outside of it, that's all they want to see. And I kind of regret it now because I would have at least liked to visit inside. Because that is a kind of cool historical thing to to see since it's so popular and you know i don't know tony have you ever been there no um i have never been there but we have tried to book reservations and you literally have to wait like five years so not anymore because i actually went on the website recently when we were well doing this I think because of the pandemic and stuff, I think, you know, it's pricey too. Maybe the prices have gone down, but the last time that we looked, um, we were waiting four point something they gave us years and we were like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. That's insane. But, um, yeah, it's usually, again, it's a tourist thing. It's a tourist attraction. When we grow up, we grew up with this. We grew up, you know, even saying the nursery rhyme. We knew the story, we knew everything that happened. We're kind of desensitized, but somebody who lives, I don't know, on the West Coast would be like, oh, I want to go see it, you know, like, you know, through media and social media and stuff, people talking about Lizzie Borden. Yeah, it's a tourist trap, you know what I mean? People are going to want to go there. Yeah, that's what the city is known for. I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> I've always used to joke about that, like, oh, yeah, I'm from Fall River, you know, the Lizzie Borden case. Um, and that seems to be the only thing that people know about Fall River. Like, oh, yes, yes. But anything else you tell them? Nope. Battleship Cove. That's like a really popular area with the battleships. But you mentioned that. Nobody knows what that is. You mentioned Lizzie Borden. You could be from another country and they might know what that is. So, yeah, it's just it's weird because you hear about it. But again, it's it's like Tony said, too. Why didn't we go see this growing up? I mean, we lived there, you lived right around the corner, I lived in the city. It's just something that never, never even crossed my mind. Nobody ever talked about it. My family never said, oh, we want to go here. And I think it's just part of that, you know, that lure of like people want to see what they're far away from. Kind of like when you're dating and you're like, oh, I want what I can't have (laughs) type of deal. I think it's more of a curiosity thing because there's a lot of, you know, sub lores of Lizzie Borden still in the house. And there's like reoccurrence things like people have different and they want to see things they want to sit in the spot where sadly the father lost his life they want to stand in the spot where the mother stepmother lost their life and Derek please correct me if I'm wrong wasn't her father a mortician as well I honestly do not know I don't know. Hold on, let me just look so real let me quick. check oh, real quick. I'm... Yeah, look real quick. I never heard because that. I th- well, he got his wealth, and he got his wealth because he was thrifty. Obviously, there was a money problem, and he didn't like to spend it. But I thought he was a mortician. But maybe I could be wrong. Not at the house itself. It was like a building next door or something like that. But I could, again, I could be wrong. What it is is he was a manufacturer in the sale of furniture and caskets. So he just would make caskets, oh, not a mortician. Okay. Yeah. okay. Ironically. So, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't even know if that's ironically because we're all going to die. And well, yeah. Somebody- <laughs> and also property yeah. development, it says. The, okay. So he, he made caskets. Yeah, among other and things. And that's creepy that. It adds to the creep factor. Yeah, exactly. That's that's more of what it is. But people like to get spooked. They like to go places because they want to believe. So they'll go to hotbeds, and Lizzie Borden is a hotbed. What do you think, Tony? Do you think she did it? Uh, I mean, who else could it have been? Her sister? I don't, this is the thing, though. It was such a sloppy job with the detect with you know the police, and they did such a shit job. But what if it was that both of them? I don't trust. I don't trust what That's what I kind of think. Or at least the because... sister helped conspire. Because obviously if Lizzie had blood on her and they're both in it, sister isn't going to say, yeah. yeah, she was bloody. She might have given her time to, I don't know. I think that's kind of a likely thing. Because if both of them did want to spend their money, their father's money, then that would be a way to achieve it. The thing is, though, Lizzie was spending his money. Obviously it was, you know, she was a klepto. 
Well, but I guess the thing that really annoyed them was like the house because like they didn't even have um, indoor plumbing, which they could, which wasn't you know a big thing yeah. at the time, but they could have easily afforded that. It was just he was very yeah you know didn't spend a lot. Yeah, I mean, I don't see, uh, see that's the thing too. I want it. <sighs> Yeah, and I mean, I'm not gonna kill my father because he's because he's cheap. But burning the the dress and then her sister, like, defending her—that's weird. But, I mean, why else would you burn clothes? Was that popular back then? I think they said that was something they did frequently, but I don't know how true that is. But why would you do that after the murders to make yourself yeah. look weird? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, if sometimes people they they they're like, well, I'm innocent then they go on to their day-to-day. You know what I mean? I don't know why she burnt it. I don't know. I'm in the middle of it. Do they know like, I don't... whose axe it was? Did it belong to the family, or was it... Mm. Did they not determine that? I, d- I don't know. I don't know. I think it almost was just assumed, because it was upstairs, I think, like in a, a chest somewhere, so something like that. So I don't, like, they just assumed, because who else would it have been? And how old was Lizzie when it happened? Wasn't she in her 20s? Or was it 30s? I think she was considered 32. a spinster. Thirty-two. Yeah, okay. she was considered a spinster. Her father wanted her to marry, but she did not want to marry. I don't know if she ever did marry. Did she marry? I don't think she did. I know her sister was married. I think. Were there rumors that she was a, a lesbian too? I think I heard that. Oh, see, I heard the opposite. I heard that she's just very promiscuous. Oh, okay. <laughs> and because of her being very promiscuous is why the men didn't, you know, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? You know, yeah. like... <laughs> I think, too, there was also some suspect of sexual and physical abuse going on in the house and incest, but that's just something that was kind of talked about in a rumor and never really discussed during the trial. It was also something that really wasn't spoken of a lot back then, so... Which would have been another motive, but that's just pure speculation. So that's another thing. Did she do it, or did she not do it, or was it self-defense? Well, I think if anything, it wasn't self-defense in the fact that, like, she did that as a response to it just happening. If anything, it was, you know, revenge, I guess you could say. Yeah, it could be revenge. But if there was, just say, if there was a speculation of that kind of abuse in the house... She probably finally snapped, and she was like, yeah. Because I know that the father was sleeping. Yeah, and the mother, the stepmother yeah. had been hit, like, I guess it was proved that she was facing the person at the time, and she was also fully dressed, and the father was sleeping, so I don't, yeah, I don't think it was an immediate response to something like that, but it could have been pent up, you know, over time. It's one of those things we're never really going to know the truth of. They screwed it up so bad, and it, and it continues on, like you said, the John Bonet Ramsey. The police screwed it up so bad that we'll never really know. And the the longer we wait, the more people, you know, like her mother passed away and stuff. Like we'll never know. Yeah. yeah. And they, I know they have for the bed and breakfast. They have the house supposed. It's supposed to look exactly like it did back then, which makes it even more creepy. <laughs> yeah, they had custom furniture there as well. They tried to make everything exactly how it was especially in the photos that they did have from the investigation but yeah they they really tried to keep it they did update it it does have electricity it does have indoor plumbing obviously but it looks almost the same when i was looking it up i saw a girl on youtube who who booked the room and usually there's other people and they let different people book the rooms but somebody canceled last minute, so she ended up being in that entire house by herself. Like, the people in charge, they don't stay there overnight, so she was in the house completely by herself, this young girl, and she was from out of town, another state, and she made a YouTube video of it, and she was scared shitless. Like, she just, like, I was like, oh my god, she's brave for not canceling that thing. Like, completely by herself in a, a strange city. And she said she heard noises and stuff and footsteps, so who knows? I don't I don't think Lizzie Borden haunts that house. If anybody haunts that house, it has to be the stepmother and the father. That's what I think. Yeah, because I don't even think she died in that. I mean, I could be wrong, but you know, what would she have a reason to haunt there if I think it does exist? Yeah. Creepy stuff. All right. Anything else? No, that's it. All right, guys. Well, thank you. That concludes our spooky segment of this autumn-themed episode. So I hope you guys listening 
enjoyed what we talked about and and learned new things and you know we highly suggest go out there try our recipes watch the movies we suggested look up more on the bridgewater triangle all that stuff and you'll be in the complete autumn mood so we just have one more question for you guys that i thought would be fun to answer and that is just basically simple what do you guys love about the fall give me three things that you love about it First thing I love about it, which I feel like Tony can attest to, and even you, is Halloween. It's easily one of my favorite holidays right next to Christmas. I can never pick which one I like more. Halloween time, I like Halloween more than Christmas time, I like Christmas more. I also love pumpkin pie, which is why I picked that recipe, because that's one of the best things. It's one of those You know you can that... eat that. Can't you eat Yeah, I was just around? about to say. <laughs> but it's one of those ones that I don't like to, because then it makes it more special for... It's like eggnog on Kuala. Well, I mean, I guess eggnog you can't. But yeah, nevertheless, it's like yeah. it makes it more special. Like hot cocoa. You could technically drink that around any time of the year, but it's better Christmas time. And then I also just love the weather, because I really hate heat and sweating. I don't mind the cold, like I like winter as well, but fall is just the nice, perfect 55 to 60 degrees. I can go out still in a t-shirt and shorts and be comfortable, but feel a little chilly breeze, and it's perfect. All right, Tony? I was trying to think of a third one, but really Halloween and uh, horror movies. I really can't think of a third one. Besides spending, obviously spending, you know, holidays with the family and stuff, but definitely Halloween, horror movies, and spending time with the family. Also, I get to see, you know, how creative my nephew is, what he's going to be for Halloween, which I think it's going to be a, a velociraptor. He's very into dinosaurs. So nice. that will be interesting. That's cute. <laughs> okay. Awesome. What about you, Aaron? I was just about What's to say, whoa, whoa, where's your shit? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the, the weather and just the way it looks. I, not in California, obviously. Um, I'd rather be on the East Coast during the fall and winter. I know that sounds crazy. A lot of people out here, oh my god, but the weather is so much nicer in California. But that's what I grew up with. It doesn't feel like fall and winter without, you know, falling leaves and snow. So that's definitely something I like. And I even... <laughs> see, I, I got you guys in your autumn packages the fake leaves. But I also got them for myself so I can feel more at home. Uh, since the leaves don't really fall as much over here and then Halloween is always fun definitely and just the overall vibe um, watching movies I know people don't like when it gets darker earlier a lot of people don't like that but I feel like that signifies the coziness of autumn um, it makes you feel just like you want to curl up and read a good book or watch a good movie have some coffee or hot chocolate and and I love sweaters and I'm that type of girl who just loves sweaters sweatshirts cardigans that type of thing I love wearing that stuff that's my style and you can't do that in the summer it's way too hot in the spring not really that type of deal either so that's probably another thing just the clothes getting to wear the clothes I love and the colors I really like the colors like the the mustard yellows and the oranges and the browns and the all of that. Yeah, Cleveland Browns colors. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wear it all my brown stuff right now for the game. It's all fall themed. Matches the blanket. <laughs> well, no brown, but yeah. Yeah, it's definitely my favorite season. Is it your favorite season? Yeah, like I said, I like winter too, yeah. but I mean, I think if I had to pick, it'd be fall. I don't mind spring. Spring can be okay on certain days, but summer, ugh. Summer was only fun when you were a kid and you had summer vacation. Yeah, it definitely was. I don't even, I was born in the summer and I can't stand it. The only time I could stand it, you're right, when you were a kid and that was the only time you had a, off of school, so you had to like it. But I think as an adult too, you just, you're not, you know, you don't go to pools and, and parties and things like that as much, so it's just not fun. As fun. Yeah, I really love swimming, but I haven't swam in so many years because I just no, don't yeah. do it as much. <laughs> what about you, Tony? Is this your favorite season? Um, I do like Halloween. I love Halloween. But uh, I wish Halloween was in the summer. I'm a summer oh, person. Oh, wow, you're complete off. It's probably... Be <laughs> yeah, I like, the, I like the summer only because the winters can be so harsh in Boston. They really can. They're horrible i know but that's i mean part i'm of the built charm. for it yeah like we're built for it and stuff like that it's just summer is just way too short but it seems like this year summer is kind of linger a little bit 
so hopefully we have a warm No, Halloween. hopefully we don't. <laughs> well, it's in the 50s and 60s here. So that's, to me, that's warm. Like right now, it's like 51 degrees. So. Yeah. Hopefully it stays that way for Halloween. Yeah. And I love all the autumn Instagram accounts. And there's so many out there. And it's just like, all you have to do is look at an autumn Instagram account and you're going to feel the vibe. It's cool. That is what you should use Instagram for. <laughs> we won't say anymore, but there's stuff people use it for that shouldn't be used for it. But anyway. Yeah, so happy fall, guys. It's officially fall. Happy fall, happy autumn, whatever you call it. Yeah, happy fall. Although I consider fall to be all of September, but I guess the official date would be 22nd. Yes. And this will be out in October, so it will be right in the middle. Smack dab in the middle of fall. Just before Halloween but a month before Thanksgiving. All right, and happy fall to everyone listening. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this, and we hope we got you in the fall mood. Quickly before we go, uh, Tony, you're a streamer. What's your information if people want to go and check your stream out or contact you to let you know they tried the green junk? <laughs> okay, yes, I am a streamer slash gamer. We have shows uh, twice a week. Uh, you can find me under Zero to Manic on any platform. Uh, we're mostly on Facebook and on um, YouTube as well. You can contact me on the backup page of Zero to Manic 3.0. And that's spelled out zero, right? And then spelled the number out two. zero, yeah. So spelled out zero and then the number two and then Manic. Yes. Awesome. And Derek, you make YouTube videos for gamers. Where can they reach you if they want to tell you if they had a slice of your pumpkin pie? <laughs> yeah, um, they can find my channel, and I guess if they wanted to reach me, Instagram would be the best spot at Sinister Games, which is all one word, and games is spelled with a Z at the end, so it's easier to find. Cool. All right, and guys, don't forget to subscribe uh, to this channel so so we can reach more people with the podcast, because the more subscribers, uh, the easier it is to find, the more it's suggested to people, all that jazz. So yeah, if you could subscribe, I'd appreciate it. Give a review on you know Apple Podcasts. If you want to add the podcast on social media, you can go to Aaron Glow Podcast on Instagram. I'll look up In the Know with Aaron Glow on Facebook. There's a page for it I just made. Yeah, or you can just go to AaronGlow.com. That's my main website. You'll find information about the podcast and my other projects there. Tony, Derek, I'm so glad you guys came back. And hopefully we'll do it again, you know, for another fun-themed episode to be determined in the future. But... Yeah, thank you guys so much for coming back and sharing your stories, your information and inspiration and all of that. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you for having us and y'all keep safe out there. So I'm going to end the episode like I do with every episode with a relative inspirational quote. And this one is from author Stanley Horowitz. Winter is an etching. Spring, a watercolor. Summer, an oil painting. And autumn, a mosaic of them all. Thank you guys so much for listening.